اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم صاد والقرآن ذی الذکر بل الذین کفروا فی عزت و شقاق کم اہلکنا من قبلهم من قرن فنادا ولا تحين مناص وعجبوا أن جاءهم منذر منهم وقال الكافرون هذا ساحر كذاب رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله beginning the study of Surah Saad 88 آيات the 38th Surah of the Quran and this Surah is actually one of the rather difficult Surahs in terms of tafsir in terms of understanding uh, it mentions some of the stories of prophets that are uh, when not given proper attention uh, one can reach some very strange conclusions about so inshallah ta'ala we'll, we'll try to cover those challenges as we uh, venture through this surah. This surah is right after Surah Al-Safat and it does have some very beautiful continuations from the conversation of Surah Al-Safat. And it's one of those places in the Qur'an, at least for me personally, that more and more convinces me of the Qur'an's coherence. Uh, you know, droplets of it we've, we can discover and we can see, and there are other aspects of its coherence and how things tie together that become that manifest to a person over the course of their studies. And to other scholars, you know, if you take bits and pieces of the works of scholars, some have made some observations here, some there, some de- try to develop an entire system for understanding how the arguments are structured. And perhaps that's a very difficult exercise because you can't really cage the word of Allah into some kind of logical system. You know, because at the end of the day, human logic has its own restraints, right? So, and Allah Azza wa Jalla's word is above that. Um, but regardless, whatever efforts have been made, you know, there are classical and contemporary scholars that say, well, no, the only kind of cohesion in the Qur'an is that of its ideas, its wisdom. So that, you know, the teachings don't contradict one another anywhere in the Qur'an. And other than that, there is no... Any other form of cohesion, meaning how arguments and surahs go one after the other, and how they have consistency with each other, and how they flow into one another, that's all kind of subjective, and it doesn't really have too much benefit. So there's that position. That's not my position at all. Um, and I, you know, I've tried to give that position weight, at least for me, though I respect that it's a scholarly position, and it's a classical one at that. Um, But this classical position of the existence of Qur'an's coherence, I get more and more convinced of it as I study Qur'an, as I see, you know, how words are, and I don't highlight all of that when I do this series, but as words are reiterated, as ideas are hinted at from the surah right before, and you go, oh, okay, yeah, that was just right there, and then Allah just, just finished that lesson off over here for us even though they weren't revealed in this order. And that's the, that's the major logical hurdle for the opponents of the view, right? Because the surahs weren't revealed in this order, necessarily. It's not necessarily the case that Surah Al-Sad was revealed after Surah Al-Safat. So, but we have to understand there are two kinds of curricula. There's, I mean, I'd like to call it the seerah and the Qur'an. There are two curricula. The seerah is the you know, the life of the Prophet ﷺ, which also corresponds with the chronological revelation of the Qur'an. So the chronological revelation would be basically the seerah. That is one curriculum. The ayat came down, then these came down, then these came down, then these came down. And as a matter of fact, it's even possible that within a surah, some parts of it came down later, and some parts of it came down earlier, and they're not even in that order in that surah. That's possible too. That an earlier ayah in the same surah was revealed way later, and a later ayah in the same surah was revealed much earlier. But it was according to the right occasion. There was a, there was a, a situation, an instance, where that ayah was needed, and so it was revealed. And so when people, and, and nobody denies that that's the case, that the Qur'an was not revealed in the order in which we find it. And so that becomes a big argument in favor of those who say, well, because it wasn't revealed in this order, how can you say this is, this has benefit? 
because we don't know the original order. So it's a collection of wisdoms, but not necessarily a collection of wisdoms that is tied together, because the original sequence isn't this sequence. But to me, there are actually two curricula. There's the curriculum of the seerah, which is the advantage of a sabiqun as sabiqun, the first and foremost generation were given this, that sequencing, because they needed it at the right moment. It was original revelation at the right moment, ayah by ayah. It wasn't even surah by surah, it was really ayah or passage by passage that they were given. Sometimes just one ayah, sometimes a full passage, rarely even a full surah. Like Fatiha, the whole surah was revealed at once, for instance, or shorter surahs. But then there was the eventual curriculum, meaning this ummah is going to look at the seerah, we're going to look back, and we're going to be looking at it in hindsight, meaning we have Hindsight is 2020. We see the entire seerah before us. The Sahaba didn't see the entire seerah before them. They had to experience it. They didn't know Hijrah is around the corner. They didn't know that after Badr there's Uhud, and after Uhud there's Ahzab, and after Ahzab there's Hudaybiyah. They didn't know these things. They had to experience them one at a time. But then even when they had gone through the entire original teachings, Allah reorganized the lessons for them. And this is tawqifi, everybody agrees with that much, at least, or most scholars agree with that much, that the Prophet wasallam. by the way, when I use the, word, the term tawqifi, it means it's instructed by the Prophet wasallam. So we just take it. For example, in this surah, when you read Sa'ad wal Qur'ani dhikr Sa'ad is a haf muqatta'a. It's a, it's a letter that's read by itself, by itself. Now, it's not an ayah. When you read Alif Lam Mim, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى المتقين. Alif Lam Mim is an ayah. But Sa'ad is not an ayah. This is a matter that is tawqifi. The Prophet ﷺ told us, this one's an ayah, this one's not an ayah. And we leave it up to him. The same thing is the matter actually with, and there's enough evidence for that, in the sequence of the Qur'an surahs. It's tawqifi. So if, we've, if we come to that much conclusion at least, then we know that there is wisdom. There is something going on in this sequencing. And the rest of the, the generations of the Ummah are going to go experience the Qur'an not in the seerah's order according to the wisdom of Allah Azza wa Jal, but in the order that this has been instituted. And this was actually something established by the Sahaba radiallahu anhu ajma'in, reading one-seventh of the Qur'an once a day. One-seventh of the Qur'an meaning finishing the entire Qur'an in a week, in this order. I talked about that in the introduction to the Qur'an, how there's Fatiha is one surah by itself, and then you have the, the, you know, it stands apart, really, as though it's the opening, the preface to the book. Then you have three surahs, three surahs that make up the first seventh of the Qur'an. Baqarah, Al-Imran, Nisa. Then you have five surahs that makes up, make up the next seventh. Then you have seven surahs that make up the next seventh. Then you have nine surahs that make up the next seventh. Then eleven surahs that make up the next seventh. Then thirteen surahs, five, three, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, and the last section is 65. 13 times 5. 65. It's, it's pretty amazing. And that was the sequencing that the Sahaba recited it in. And this is the sequence of the Mus'haf itself. So, even numerically, there's some structure going on. There's something happening. You know? Anyhow, so we'll, we'll come back to this and I'll share with you why in this particular surah. Just last night I was reciting and I was like, SubhanAllah, that's incredible. I won't tell you yet. When we get to it, I'll share it with you, inshallah. Sa'ad wal Qur'ani the dhikr. Sa'ad, the Qur'an, I swear by the Qur'an, full of the power to remind. The possessor of reminder. So Qur'an's name is the reminder, and also the possessor of reminder. So it, it is on the outside, the name, you know, it's, as beautifully explained by one scholar, there's a name that's on the outside of someone. There's a wasf that's on the outside of someone, a description. A name is kind of a way to remember someone but when you look at them. But you don't look inside them, you only look on the outside of them. So for example, somebody's name is Kareem. Okay? Now, Kareem could be their name and also their description. Kareem means noble. Okay? But Kareem is just something on the outside. But when you say that that person is filled with nobility, he is dhu karama. He's dhu karama. He's, he's the possessor of nobility. So the outside of the Qur'an, the first exposure of the Qur'an that you're going to have is its dhikr. In huwa illa dhikrun wa Qur'anun mubin. And then when you dive deeper into the Qur'an, you'll find out how much it possesses reminder. I swear by the Qur'an that possesses reminder, that owns reminder. Then notice the letter Sa'd. The previous surah was, was Sa'fati Saffad. The surah began with Sa'ds. 
and then this one Saad, and immediately when you think of Saad, what, what word comes to mind that you've already, as a lesson, experienced? As-Safat. As-Safat. And we'll see some of the mention of angels here again too. بَلِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فِي عِزَّةٍ وَشِقَاقٍ This is not the جواب القسم. You know, when you have an oath, you call attention. And Allah just swore by the Qur'an that possesses a reminder. I swear by the Qur'an that possesses a reminder. You swear what? Okay, you swear by the Qur'an, what do you want to tell me? There is no جواب القسم here. There is no response to the oath. And this is actually one of the significant, unique features of the Qur'an that Allah on multiple occasions will swear by something and then leave it hanging, if you want to put it in that way. He won't, respond, he won't tell you what he was going to say. You know why? Because he expects people to figure it out themselves. Yaseen wal Qur'an al hakim Then the response, إِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ If you understood that, that Allah is swearing by the Qur'an to validate that He in fact is a messenger. And they know that when Allah swears by the Qur'an, that's established now. Allah is calling on the Qur'an as evidence for the validation of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And if Sa'ad, Allahu alam what Sa'ad means, but if it is alluding to the angels, then we know where the Qur'an comes from. It comes from the angels that deliver it. But these, these guys, these disbelievers, they don't want to reach the conclusion that's right in front of them. So the next ayah makes complete sense. بَلِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فِي عِزَّةٍ وَشِقَاقٍ Rather, the disbelievers are absorbed. They are, they are sunk. They are immersed in their sense of authority and respect. Pride. عِزَّةِ الْإِثْمِ وَهِيَ التَّعَالِي وَالْإِسْتِكْبَارِ You know, the izza means that you, they're, they're, they're holding on to their pride and they want to remain high. They're too, too high and holy to accept the, the obvious conclusion that Allah expects them to reach. وَشِقَاق Let's read something about the word shiqaq. مِنْ شِقْ It comes from the word shiq. وَهِيَ حُدُوثُ فَاصِلْ بَيْنَ شَيْئَيْنِ And it's the, current, it's the existence of a separation between two things. وَلِهَذِهِ مَعَانٍ كَثِيرًا فِي اللُّغَى نَقُولْ هَذَا فِي شِقْ وَذَلِكَ فِي شِقْ بِمَعْنَى لَا يَلْتَقِيَانِ We say in Arabic, it has many meanings. And you say in Arabic, هَذَا فِي شِقْ وَذَلِكَ فِي شِقْ Meaning this is on this end, this is on that end, they're never going to meet. Shiqaq means you're in a schism. You're never going to meet with something. You're not going to come together with something. You know how you have, a, you, there's a person you absolutely hate, you have shiqaq for them. I can't even be in the same room with them. I'll never talk to them. I have shiqaq with them. I don't want anything to do with them. They're cut apart. And that's from this word we get in shiqaq. Like Surah Tul, in shiqaq. When shaqqat is sama, when the sky is completely torn, so one part of it will never meet the other part again. They're completely torn apart. You know? This is the same word that Allah uses, for example, when the rock, you know, cracks open. You know, لَمَا يَتَشَقَّقُ there's a, there's a kind of rock that cracks open, you can't recover it now. And they've cracked open and rolled over off the cliff on either side, they can't be put together now. They're separated completely. So what does it mean here? These disbelievers are so stubborn, that they will never put together the two things they should. What are the two things? First of all, the evidence. Second of all, the conclusion. There are two things that should go together, evidence and conclusion. The evidence has already been placed. What is it? وَالْقُرْآنِ ذِي الذِّكْرِ That's the evidence. Qur'an full of reminder. What's the conclusion? The one that they should reach to themselves, which is that they, you know, that he is from the messengers. He is from among those who have been sent. But they're, they're too stuck, in, they're too engrossed in their shiqaq. So they won't let that happen. And so Allah doesn't even mention the conclusion to highlight how much shiqaq they have. How much they won't even reach that conclusion. So the conclusion is not mentioned. Kam ahlakna min qablihim min qarn. How many, how many different towns? You know, this is a, actually, hada uslubun ajib fil arabiya. Kam sabartu alayk. How much patience I showed you? Kam an'amtu alayk. How many favors did I do to you? Do to you? You know? Kam in tadartu lak. How much, how long did I wait for you? This is actually a uslub shakwa. This is a, if a form of complaining in Arabic. Kama ahlakna min qablim. How many towns did I destroy? Did you lose count? How many towns have I, min qablim, from way before them, min qarnin, of different generations. Of different, qarn means towns, also means generations. And qarn li annaha mutaqarina, of similar like, meaning they're just like you. They were just, they did the same things you did and they got destroyed. Fanado. Then they called out. Nado yani. Uh, لَمْ يُذْكَرَ الْمُنَادَ هُنَا 
المنادى. He call, he mentions the one that calls. The destruction came and they just cried out. Cried out to who? Doesn't even say. Why? Because they're like anybody that can help. Remember when we saw Hamidun, the life, the, the fire of life is slowly burning out of them, and whatever cries they can make to anybody there, can anybody help me? Please, can anyone help me? And there's anybody. It's not even specifically directed to anyone. Because they don't think if they call mom, dad, police, the hopes that they're even alive is gone. So they're just at this point just calling for the sake of calling. Anyone. Fanadal. Walata hina manas. Let's read something about the word lata. This is an interesting word in the Arabic language. Some, you know, some opinion is that it's from the Yemeni dialect, that it's the form of, it's la really, or laysa, but they say lata. But this is, um, the closer, the stronger position is the following. A Sha'arabi records this. And he says, Kalimat lata mukawwana min la and nafia. It's made up of the la nafia. Like, you know how we say la ilaha illallah? La khalaqa lahum fil akhira la riba fihi. There's a ta added to that. La ta. Okay? Wazidat alayha ta. And the ta was added onto it. La lin nafi umuman fatanfi marratan. Marratan. Kama lo kult la rajul fil dar. Watanfi al makan. كما لو قلت لا دار أسكنها أو لا دار أسكنها أسف فإذا زيدت عليها التاء نفت الزمان خاصة Let me explain what this means When you add a ta to it لا تا then it doesn't just mean absolutely not it means absolutely not at that time So the ta makes it مختص it specifies it to a particular time So Allah is saying they made a call but at that time there was la hina manas, if you forget the ta for example, la, la hina manas would be the la lanfi allegiance. There was absolutely not the time to call for refuge, protection, escape at all, at that very moment. In other words, they had plenty of protection and refuge and opportunity before then. Their destruction was always there. You know, uhita bihim, it had already surrounded them, but Allah was holding it back. They had time, they had time, they had time. But then when this destruction came, لا تحينا مناس It's not at all the time at that point to call for any kind of refuge. وَعَجِبُوا أَنْ جَاءَهُمْ مُنْذِرٌ مِّنْهُمْ And they find it strange that a messenger has come to them. You know in the previous surah we read, وَالْعَجِبْتَ وَيَسْخَرُونَ You find it strange that they make fun. Now it's the flip, the other side. They find it strange that a warner came to them from within themselves. See, this idea of warners coming from within themselves, why is that strange? Because a warning comes from a place where you're not. Like, for example, somebody comes and tells you, hey, there's a, there's a really big storm coming. You don't have the radio, you don't have TV or internet or 3G or whatever. Somebody who has news has to come and tell you. Somebody who's with you, now think ancient times, there's no mass media. So if the town is going to hear about a warning that nobody else knows about, then it has to come from an outsider. It can't come from someone among them. That doesn't make sense. You have to go out, see something that I don't see, and then come and warn me. So they find it strange that he's warning us and he's among ourselves. You didn't go anywhere to get this. You didn't go anywhere. The, actually, the, your claim is, you didn't have to go anywhere to get this warning. The warning actually came to you. The warning came to you. But we don't see it. So they find it weird. وَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ هَذَا سَاحِرٌ كذاب. And the disbeliever said, this is a magician. You know, this is a change of tone. We're learning this, that this surah is more aggressive in the, in the, what it quotes of the kuffar. First of all, they find it strange. That's a little light. But you know how previously we even saw that there was a hint of feeling bad for the Prophet ﷺ? Maybe he's lost his mind. What's really going on with him? You know, they're concerned about him. But now, he's, هَذَا سَاحِرٌ كَذَّابٌ This is a magician. And he perpetually lies, he lies over and over and over and over again. And that's a very strange combination of words. It actually proves the inconsistency of their claim inside it. First of all, they find it strange. But if you find it strange, that means you don't have an explanation. That's when you find something strange, when you can't explain it. But by the end of their statement, they are offering an explanation. Their, their, their explanation is, he's a magician, he's a liar. Then there's the other thing. Magicians, magicians are, yes, they are a form of liars. It is a form of lying magician. But magicians to them were someone you, they looked up to. It was a skill. 
Now, what is the Prophet doing that's magic? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Magic is usually, and you guys know this already, because you don't watch any TV shows. Magic is not something to be heard, but rather something to be seen. You pull a butterfly out of your hat, or a pigeon or something, or a rabbit, or you keep taking out a napkin that doesn't end or something. It's stuff to be seen. You don't talk to somebody and they hear you and they go, Whoa, magical. That doesn't happen. But there's something about this language. There's something about this Qur'an. When they experience listening to it, they can't explain what's going on to them. They're mystified by it. They describe it as magical. What I'm trying to tell you is, first of all, they can't explain it. When they do explain it, they explain it with a word that suggests there is no, there's no worldly explanation. This is some supernatural thing because magic is definitely what? Supernatural. So they've already believed in a supernatural. This is an acceptance of the power of the Qur'an from the mouth of the kuffar, sahir. Then there's the matter of kathab, which is also very interesting. It's an interesting insult against the Prophet ﷺ. Kathib means a liar. Kathab means perpetual liar. Comes someone who lies over and over and over again. Now, the nature of perpetual liars, like con men, people that have an agenda, they lie over and over again. They lie here, they lie there, they lie there. When their lies called out, what do they do? They pack their bags and find some other sap. They go somewhere else to impress another innocent audience. And when if, if somebody from the other town, hey, you did this in our town, calls them out. Then they pack their bags and run and find some other place farther away to make their lie again. A kadhab cannot keep going back to the same people who exposed him because that doesn't work. If you already know I'm, I'm conning you, trying to con you, you're not going to come back to me. I'll tell you a story, a little small, small story. My, my mother-in-law, when she went to Hajj, you know, a few years ago, this guy comes to her. Aap India se lagti hai. Kati hai, haa, India se hoon. मैं भी इंडिया से हूँ मेरा बटवा गुम गया है मेरा पासपोर्ट गुम गया माय माय यू सी आर यू फ्रॉम इंडिया यस आई एम फ्रॉम इंडिया एंड शी सेज माय माय आई लॉस्ट माय वॉलेट एंड माय पासपोर्ट इज गॉन एंड आई एम हंग्री फॉर टू डेज कुड यू प्लीज हेल्प मी एंड ही हैड लाइक अ होल फाइव मिनट लाइन कुड यू प्लीज हेल्प मी सो शी गिव्स हिम सम मनी गोज अवे फाइव मिनट्स लेटर अ सिमिलर गाय शोज अप आप इंडिया से लगती हैं You look like you're from India. She goes, yeah, I'm from India. I'm from India too. Mentions the same town the other guy mentioned. I lost my passport and, and my wallet. Can you give me some money? She goes, no, I already gave. Third guy shows up. You look like you're from India. And she goes, hold on. Let me tell you what town you're from. <laughs> you lost your passport, right? And your wallet? Guy ran away. That's what a kathab does. That's what a kathab does. If they're trained and they memorize the same line, <laughs> you know, they're going to run. But this messenger, so a kathab is someone who goes, who switches audiences. The, my, my point is, he switches audiences. If the Prophet ﷺ is a kathab, is he switching audiences or is he sticking to the same audience? It doesn't make sense. Why would he keep making the same lies over and over to the same crowd? If they call him a liar, he'd say, okay, you got me. Find somebody else. But no, he stays with the same crowd. Then they say, then the truth comes out. Then the truth comes out. Finally, the, you know, the, the character assassinations and the internal contradictions in their own claims don't add up. So then they resort to, they, they have to address the real problem. Did he take all of our gods, all of our deities, all of our multiple divine beings and turn them into just one? Inna hadha la shay'un ujab. That's what's really weird. That's the really weird thing, let me tell you. You know, this is a, a conversation among kuffar. And I say, this guy's a magician, he's a liar. No, he's not, he's not. You know, but let me tell you, okay, yeah, I know. I know, it doesn't sound like it's a, he's a magician, doesn't sound like he's a liar. But let me tell you what's really weird about him. He takes all our gods and makes them into one. Does that make sense to you? 
So all of our gods, don't, none of them make sense. None of our ancestors knew what they were talking about. Your grandfather, he says your grandfather's stupid. You want to accept that? That's, that's how they convince each other. In هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ This is a very, very strange thing. I told you the story about Ujab before. I'll repeat it because it's a fun story. This guy comes to the Prophet ﷺ, kafir, comes to the Prophet ﷺ, and says, your Qur'an has mistakes. It uses words that aren't found in the Arabic language. It uses the word Ujab. Ujab is instead of Ajib. The Arabic word Ajib. And the Ajib version of Ajib is Ujab. Okay? That's Ujab. Then you have Asad. In Arabic, Asad means what? Anybody know Asad? Lion. The Quran uses Qaswara. Qaswara. What was the third word? Do you remember? Can't remember? There was a third word too. Let me think. If I remember, if I remember I'll, I'll let you know. Um, so, he says these words, there were three words, but he says these words aren't in Arabic. You just made these up. So, Sulsa Sim calls the poet of the Prophet, Hassan ibn Thabit. He wasn't there. He calls him. Can you bring him? So he comes. Hassan sit down. He sits down. He says, get up and leave. So he got up and leave. No, 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 actually come back and sit down. So he got up and he came and sat down again. No, 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 actually get up and leave. So he's leaving it. No, 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 Hassan, come, come sit down, sit down. So he did this three, four times. To Hassan, Hassan, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ So he's going <laughs> to, he's going back and forth, back and forth, and he, until he's like, يَا قَصْوَرَةَ Arab. A lion of the Arabs. Like he, he got so weirded out, he addressed the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Qaswarat al Arab. The same word he said doesn't exist in Arabic. Hassan ibn Thabit called the Prophet that. Lion of the Arabs. He didn't say Asad al Arab, he said, Ya Qaswarat al Arab. And then, Hada Shaykhun Ujab. He turns to him and says, This is a really strange thing you're doing. And doesn't say Hada Shaykhun Ajib, he said Hada Shaykhun Ujab. <laughs> Subhanallah. So, inna hada la shay'un ujab. This is certainly a very strange thing. I'll find that third word. It's going to bother me today. But I'll find that third word too. Wan talaq al mala. This is a really interesting ayah. Wan talaq al mala'u minhum. Then the chieftains, the ones who fill the tribunal, you know, in the, in the villages, there's a tribunal. All the, all the elders of the village sit together and they make their counsel and, you're not supposed to interrupt and all of that. So now there's a scene in which all of those leaders, they're sitting along with the Prophet wasallam. He's reciting Qur'an and they all show up. Now when one of them shows up, it's a big deal. But when all of them show up and the Sahaba are listening, some slaves are listening, some youth are listening, some curious Makkans are listening that aren't even Muslims yet. They're kind of just walking by, the Qur'an's being recited, they're listening. Whether they're, you know, they're believers in it or not. You guys, we don't have much of that here, but in New York City we have that. You know, in New York City, the people of all different faiths and religions in the middle of Times Square, they just grab a, like a, you know, jukebox and a mic, and they just go at it. Judgment Day is coming! This whole place is gonna be destroyed! You guys, but, and the people start crowding up around them. So there's a, I mean, the Sahaba are there for a purpose, but then there are people who are just listening for the sake of listening. They're also in it. And now the elite of Makkah show up. And they're listening. And they listen for a little while. And now we already heard what they have to say. It's a magician. A lot, and all of them are saying it. Now if one of them says that it carries weight, but if all of them say it in union, it carries a lot of weight. And then they just walk off. فَانْطَلَقَ الْمَلَأُ مِنْهُمْ Then they walked off from them. And then as they're walking off, they're looking at the rest of the crowd, upon whom they have influence, because these are the people of influence in Mecca, they look at them and say, Adam Shu. Go, what are you doing here now? Get out, get out, you too, move it, come on. Don't waste your time here. Alim shu, wasbiru ala alihatikum. I have a little patience with your gods. You can leave your religion that easily, what kind of people are you? So they're using their influence to now yell at the rest of the crowd as though they are immature children. That's what they're doing. Come on, come on, come on, get out of here, Alim shu. This meeting is done, leave him alone. وَاسْبِرُوا عَلَىٰ آلِهَتِكُمْ إِنَّ هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ يُرَادٌ Don't you get it? You guys are so gullible. This is something that has an intent behind it. يُرَاد يعني له أجندة له مقصد مسرور سر 
Lahusir. He's got a secret. He's got some intention behind it. He's got some agenda he's not telling you about. We could see right through it. We're the elders. We know these things. So you get out of here. Inna hada la shay'un yurad. Ma sami'na bi hada fil millati al akhirah. We didn't hear any of this ever in the old times, in the old nation, in the in the last nation, fil millati al akhirah. Now what this also is the the know it all attitude. There's a kind of person who believes they know everything there is to know. So they're not going to be brought anything of valid information ever in their life. Nothing that they need is going to be brought to them from anywhere else. Because they already know everything. They're already on top of ilm. So when they hear something they've never heard before, it must be invalid. Why? Because I've never heard it before. If it was worth knowing, then I would be the first to know it. If I didn't hear of it, that's got to be useless information. Because I don't own it. This is an extreme form of intellectual pride. It's intellectual pride. In هَذَا إِلَّا اخْتِلَاق This is nothing but a creative invention. اخْتِلَاق يَعْنِ مَا هَذَا إِلَّا كَذِبْ وَافْتِرَى was one basic meaning. It's nothing but a lie and a made up thing. وَمَعْنَى الْاخْتِلَاق خَلْقُ الشَّيْءِ بِلَا وَاقِعْ يُسَانِدُهُ This is the creation of something with no basis that you can go back and rely on. Something that's made up. خَلْق creation. اخْتِلَاق creative creation. Something that's just, he's gone really elaborate out of his way to make this up. That's why you were so so captured by it, by its magic. But get out of here. أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ الذِّكْرُ مِنْ بَيْنِنَا The ultimate reminder was sent to him from among us. We, the elders, the leaders of Quraysh, the ones that everybody recognizes as the owners of wisdom in this town. None of us got this wisdom and he got it. Really? Was there no better qualified candidates in Makkah available? أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ الذِّكْرُ مِنْ بَيْنِنَا بَلْهُمْ فِي شَكِّمْ مِنْ ذِكْرِ Now Allah interjects, makes this comment. The fact of the matter is, they are really in doubt about, my, about remembering me. They're not so sure if remembering me is such a good idea. بَلْلَمَّا يَذُوقُ عَذَابٍ Rather the cases that they haven't tasted punishment yet. They, these people are at a stage that the only thing that can set them straight is punishment. Teachers know that. Teachers know that. Especially old time teachers. Not, not um, teachers in America because we have policies here. But there's a, there's a student that the only thing that straightens this kid out is you tell his parents. Actually that's wa- far worse in Pakistan, India than any beating. Just tell his parents. Then, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Then it's over. But that, then he'll set straight. He'll be awesome. My teacher did that to me in 8th grade, I was in Pakistan. I was in Pakistan for one year. Oof! It was awesome. Failed my math test, I got a 19. I have a math test. Didn't say anything. Just called my mom. <whistles> it was over. Got a 90 on the next one. <laughs> you know, all the, all the excuses, all the all the video games, all the, all of it out of my system. All of it. Not even interested. Sun goes up, sun goes down, my head's in the book. Why? Because there's some people, until they taste punishment, man, they just don't, can't set straight. Allah says about these people, they're in doubt, and they're so deluded, that the only thing that will wake them up now is punishment. Punishment hasn't yet touched them. By the way, this is one of the rare occasions of the use of lamma as not yet. Like lamma yadkhul iliman, so this is a good uh, for grammar students to take note of. أَمْ عِنْدَهُمْ خَزَائِنُ رَحْمَةِ رَبِّكَ الْعَزِيزِ الْوَحَّابِ Oh, is it the case that they possess the treasures of the mercy of your master? What the Allah is saying here is, Oh, they think that Allah should come to them because they own the treasures of revelation, wisdom. Dhikr comes to them because they're the elders of the tribe. So they should be the ones to open those vaults. Because they're the ones that have the authority on them, as opposed to Allah being Al-Aziz. And they should grant the gift of revelation, as opposed to Allah being Al-Wahhab, the giver of gifts. They should be the ones, huh? Is that what they think? How come it didn't get sanctioned by them? Nothing happens in our town unless we know about it first. How did this happen without my permission? When you own a store, and your employee moves the items on the shelf around, you say, why did you do that? I didn't tell you to do it, this is my, my store. This is our town. What do you mean wisdom came to you? 
What do you mean you get to make public announcements to the crowd? What did you sanction this with? Allah says, oh, is it the case that the treasures of wisdom had to be, were well, they in their possession? The ones that actually your master owns? Subhanallah. That's the level of arrogance. أَمْ لَهُمْ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Or is it the case that they own the dominions of the skies and the earth? This little patch of land that they think they have control over, <laughs> they think they have control over the skies and the earth, وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا And whatever lies between both of them, فَلْيَرْتَقُوا فِي الْأَسْبَابِ That they should climb up and progress higher and higher all through the means. فِي الْأَسْبَابِ Sub also can be used for a ladder, but keep going up levels upon levels upon levels into the sky. جُنْدٌ مَا هُنَالِكْ This is any army, just like that. This one, that, that army over there is just like any other. جُنْدٌ مَا These are armies we've seen before. مَهْزُومٌ That is supposed to be annihilated. Hazama, Like we saw in the story of Dawood alayhi salam. فَهَزَمُوهُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ That the, 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 the Muslims that were with Dawood and Talut alayhi salam did away, annihilated the enemy. Did away with them. So they were supposed to be done away with. Just like مِنَ Ahzab. They are from the same category of other groups that came before. Speaking of other groups that came before that were meant to be annihilated, كَذَّبَتْ قَبْلَهُمْ قَوْمُ نُوحٌ قَوْمُ نُوحٍ وَعَادٌ وَفِرْعَوْنُ ذُو الْأَوْتَادِ Before them the nation of Nuh, Ad, Fir'aun who forget just chiefs and authorities, he possessed tents. الْأَوْتَادِ What it means the pegs on a tent. You know, even to this day when a military like sets camp, sets a base, what do they set up first? Tents. They set up the tents for their supplies, barracks, etc., etc. Temporary housing, you know, because that's how they keep mobile. They, keep mo- they mobilize themselves because they stay in tents. Fir'aun, he's described as the possessor of pegs. In other words, his armies were spread everywhere. And they were constantly on the move expanding the empire or putting rebellions down. So they were always in tents. So Fir'aun, the possessor of massive, mobilized armies, is captured in just the Lautad. Wa Thamud, wa Qawmu Lut, and not to mention Thamud, and the nation of Lut, wa Ashabul Aika, and the people of the giant tree, Aika. Wa Ula'ika Lahzab, that's what I mean by groups. Remember Allah just said, they are supposed to be annihilated like the groups? That those were groups that I meant. Did you get that? Did you hear about their stories? In kullun illa kathab al-rusul. Not every single one of them did nothing but the same thing. And that was what? To, li- to call messengers liar. فَحَقَّ عِقَابٍ Then my vengeance and my final outcome against them was deserved. وَمَا يَنظُرُ هَؤُلَاءِ And what, the, what did these people stare at? إِلَّا صَيْحَةً wahida, Except a large, vicious cry. An expl- explosive sound. مَا لَهَا مِنْ فَوَاقٍ There is no فَوَاق مِنْ إِفَاقَ لَا إِفَاقَ لَهُمْ بَعْدَهَا There is no recovery for them after that. مَا لَهَا مِنْ فَوَاقٍ وَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا And then they would say, these, these elders are now being sarcastic with Qur'an again. So they say, Master, عَجِّلْ لَنَا قِطَّنَا قَبْلَ يَوْمِ الْحِسَابِ our master, why don't you ex- expedite for us our audit, our report? You know, qit is at the year, at the end of the year in old days, they used to hand the, you know, sometimes you don't pay your customer, or your customer doesn't pay you cash. They pay you credit. IOUs. IOUs. Urdu me chitthi likhate Pakistan me. Aap us pe dal den chitthi. Uske aap daftar lagao ta unka hul. Uspe ho daftar arbi me kate hain. Notebook. What's the word for notebook in Urdu? Register? I don't know what they call it, but they write it down in there. That you owe me like for, for you bought carrots today and potatoes and this and that, and there's a whole register. And then the grocery store owner goes at the end of the month, yeah, 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 chitiya, bhiji. There's three, huh? Khate me dalte. Khata. That's the Urdu word. Qit. Qit is like that. It's this like register where you keep all the debits. You know how in bars they put it on the tab? Just put it on my tab, put it on my tab, put it on my tab. In a hotel, just put it on room 105. That's, and at the end of it, they give you an invoice. That invoice is called qit in Arabic. Qit to here is not the cat, by the way. <laughs> Please rush the cat for us, our cat. That's not what this means. Qit here means the, the invoice. The invoice, the debit credit, the, the end of the year budget, the audit, 
debit and credit together. They say if this day of judgment is going to give us that full audit, Master, I mean, you control everything, right? Why don't you just send us our report thus far? Let's see how we're doing. Before the day of the audit itself, let's see it. Let's see our year and register. Isbir ala ma yaqulun, the Prophet is told. Just be patient over the garbage they, they bark. Just be patient over what they're saying. Wadkur abdana Dawood. And just, you know what? Get your mind off of it. Just think about Dawood. <laughs> Don't even think about that. Let me tell you about Dawood. This is a loving expression from Allah Azza wa Jal. Somebody's upset, and you know, a mother knows how to do this, by the way. Your kid's really upset. You know, they pushed me. Hey, you know what? You know what happened in the Olympics today? And the kid's like, huh? Really? Just change the subject. Allah Azza wa just changes the subject. Just, messenger, just be patient. And you know what? Don't even think about it. Just think about Dawood alayhi salam. Then Aid, who had a lot of power, you know. He was the possessor of many hands. Aid. He had many hands, meaning he had many helping hands. Innahu awab. And he used to repeat, come back to Allah over and over again. And he used to sing praises of Allah that had chorus in it. Remember that? Awab? Awibi? Inna sakharna al-jibala ma'ahu We had subdued mountains along with him. So the Prophet ﷺ is now, his mind is on Allah's gifts to Dawud salam, Which makes him think about Allah's gifts to him. Which gets his mind off of the garbage that people say. يُسَبِّحْنَ بِالْعَشِيِّ وَالْإِشْرَاقِ And they would, they would declare Allah's perfection, the mountains along with Him, in the hours between Luhr and Maghrib al ashi Between that, you know, afternoon to evening time. وَالْإِشْرَاقِ And the later mornings, when the sun is bright. وَالطَّيْرَ مَحْشُورَةً and the, and the birds used to all be herded towards Him, flocks of birds. You ever seen in your evening commute flocks of birds flying over? and the endless flock of birds going, and you can't even know where it begins and where it ends, they would all come to him. Different species of birds in their entire flocks would herd towards him. They would come at him. كُلُّ لَهُ awab, And every single one of them would keep coming back to him and, and a chorus join along with him in his praise of Allah. وَشَدَدْنَا mulkahu, And we had fortified, strengthened his, his kingdom, his dominion. وَآتَيْنَاهُ hikmah. And we had given him wisdom, وَفَصْلَ khitab, And we had given him decisive speech. So when he passed his verdict, people would say, yeah, that makes sense, I got it. That was good. There's no, you know, بِالْعَرَبِيَةِ نَقُولْ لِكُلِّ خِطَابٍ جَوَابٍ Every speech has a counter speech. The Arab is an expression. Every, everything's got a criticism. Every YouTube video has comments at the bottom. Right? لِكُلِّ خِطَابٍ جَوَابٍ But Allah says, hey, he's got فَصْلُ الْخِطَابِ What that means is he's got decisive speech. When he gave his verdict at the end of his Supreme Court hearing, everybody was like, okay, done. You know, I used to watch a lot of uh, Judge Judy with my mom back in the day. And you know what, after the, she's done yelling at people and all that, they interview the guy that lost the case outside. I don't think she was really nice at all. And blah, blah, blah. Like... <laughs> If Dawud passes a verdict, it's first little, nobody opens their mouth. Yeah, that was awesome. I'm guilty, sure. I'm happy to go to jail. وَفَصْلَ well, الْخِطَابِ وَهَلَ أَتَاكَ نَبَعُ الْخَصْمِ That was a really cool story, by the way, guys. Really awesome story. And then we'll have to study the, we'll have to kind of look at the Israeliyat, because our classical tafasir are full of the mention of those Israeliyat also, and we'll have to do some reconciliation. Did the news of the two, the arguing groups come to you? Khasm, Ism Jama'ah, the arguing groups came to you? Is, is the Sawwarul Mihrab? Now, Dawud alayhi salam is a king. He's a khalifa. He's got a castle. And a, a castle has sur. The word surah that we know for, for the surahs of the Quran is actually the outer walls of a city. Assassin's Creed fans, large huge walls. And a castle that you have to scale. It's impossible to scale, it's this gigantic wall. You can only scale in video games, you can't really scale it and get on top and get that flag or whatever. You can't do that in normal life. But this large wall that's impossible to scale, just impossible to scale, that's a surah. Now, when somebody is able to scale that, or to scale that is called tasawwara. The, the verb for it is tasawwara. يعني تسلق لأنهم يدخلوا لم يدخلوا من الباب إنما دخلوا من أعلى الصور 
They came from the highest world that you could never expect anybody to come from. You can imagine, just to give you some visual here, there's this castle, there's a winding staircase inside the castle, and all the way on top there's a special quarter for the king. So the only way in to that quarters is through the staircase that goes up 10, 12, 15 floors, whatever it goes up. But he goes, and he's up in his private quarters, and the doors are locked, and there's guards outside, and there's a window, and from the window, a couple, a bunch of dudes just climbed into his quarters. And mihrab, mihrab is a place of prayer, and it's also like a, a palatial room. So this is up high up, high security, and he's by himself. So imagine in the White House, if you know, the White House is on the first floor, but like, Imagine the White House is up there and people are coming in from the window. And the president's by himself like, what's going on here? What are you people doing here? Now why would somebody climb the wall and come in to a king's quarters? What do you think? I mean, use your imagination. To kill him. And that's, the, that's the first impression you'd get. Now Arabic students, تَسَوَّرُوا مُفْرَدْ مُثَنَّعَمْ جَمْعَ جَمْعَ أَكْثَرْ مِنِثْ نَيْمْ the, the, so the ooh at the end of tasawwaru means there's a lot of these guys. They're like one after the other. They kept coming in. He's like, whoa. And Dawud Aysan can handle himself. We know that he can handle himself. He killed Jalut after all. Right? And Allah had given him the power to turn metal into putty. The man can handle himself. But he can handle one, he can handle two, 20, 30, 40, 50 guys are coming into his room. You know, and it's not like the, 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 you know, the martial arts films that you see where the guy fights them one at a time. And he breaks one guy's neck, and he breaks the other guy's arm, and then the other guy comes, hey, my turn, my turn. And he comes, they take one at a time. It's not like the movies, they all come at once. So he, if دَخَلُوا عَلَى Dawood, when they came on Dawood, فَفَزِعًا went minhum. He got a little shaken up by them. وَلَا يَزَالْ جَمْعًا He was shaken up by them. فَزِعْ is a kind of fear that gets you off your mind, like gets you off track. It makes you, you can't think clearly. You're not scared. You're kind of startled. Startled is a good word. He was startled, rattled by them, shaken up by them. So they all come in and they all say in unison, oh, no, no, don't, don't worry. Now why do we have to say that? Because <laughs> usually if they're coming in, they're there to kill you. On top of that, these aren't any, these aren't jokers. Because they were able to what? Scale a massive wall. <laughs> Any one of them being able to do that must be a skilled warrior. There's a whole bunch of them now. They're like, no, 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 relax. Khasmani. Khasmani. We're just, we have a problem with each other. We have a case. We filed it in the appellate court. And there's a waiting list, waiting period of six months. And then we made an appeal. But our lawyer says that he can't get a meeting with you for another six months. Uh, but our case can't wait. So we're here to solve our problem. <laughs> One of us has wronged the other. One of them, one of us has rebelled against the other. We don't have a problem with you, we got a problem with each other. That's what the situation is. Then please make judgment between us with justice, okay? You better be a fair judge. Now, they're threatening him to be a fair judge. Usually when a judge is threatened, he's threatened to be an unfair judge. But it's cool because either side is kind of threatening him, right? So he's, he's, he's really terrified at this point. وَلَا تُشْتَتْ وَلَا تَبْتَعِدْ عَنِ الْحَقْ And hey, don't push us off. This, this word, أَشَطَّ يُشِطُّ إِشْطَاتْ One of the meanings of it is, no, no, don't tell we come back next week. We don't want to hear that. Don't put us off. The other meaning of it is, and you better not just adjourn us without really thinking through the, the verdict. You better be fair. وَهْدِنَا إِلَى سَوَاءِ السِّرَاتِ Guide us to the right, the, the, the most even path. Whatever you tell us we will do, but when we're letting you know, you better be a good judge. Then each side has a representative. So the guy this side, the guy that side, they all they, they stand before uh, uh, Dawud The rest of them is a jury. They're sitting there. إِنَّ هَذَا أَخِي This actually, for real, this guy's my brother. فَلَمْ يَقُلْ هَذَا أَخِي قَالْ إِنَّ هَذَا أَخِي لِأَنَّهُمْ يَقْتَتِلَانِ لِأَنَّهُمْ يَقْتَتِلَانِ They're fighting each other. There's two groups at war. And he goes, by the way, this is my brother. My fight is with my own sibling. لَهُ تِسْعُونَ وَتِسْعُونَ نَعْجَى He owns 99 sheep. So the who the, is the rich shepherd speaking or the poor shepherd speaking? 
The poor shepherd is speaking, and he's saying this, my brother. He's got 99 sheep. And I just got one sheep. لم يقل لي نعجة نعجة يكفي الكلمة تكفي the, the word نعجة by itself is enough I have a sheep he says نعجة واحدة I just got one just one okay and he's making his case he knows how to make a case فقال and then, then he says to me أكفلنيها let me take care of your sheep كفالة to take care so first he comes to me nicely and he says, Hey, look, I have experience. I, I take care of 99. I could take your sheep, you know, if you wanted to be. And I said, No, bro, I got my own sheep. I can, I can have one sheep. So when he heard, when I try, he tried to talk to me nicely and said, I didn't listen. Then he started getting a little authoritative with me in speech. I'm your older brother. Hey, just give me your sheep, okay? I tried to be nice. He's bullying me. So I got all my friends together. Then he got all his friends together. We tried to get a court date. Didn't get one. Climbed the wall. Here we are. This is, this is the situation. This would be amazing, like a court episode in one of those court shows. This would be awesome. Except people have to jump into the judge's chambers from the ceiling or something. Gala. <laughs> now you... Now Allah was about to speak. Now let me tell you what's going on here. The controversy. I told you this surah has some difficult interpretation. There are several Israeliyat. There are several Israeliyat. And I'll give you the most horrendous version. And I'll give you the mild version within Ahl sunnah I'll give you both. Even though I'm, I'm inconvinced of either. I'm not convinced of either. But they're mentioned in our classical tradition. So I'll at least have to mention them to you. What's taken by some is that Dawud alayhi salam, great king, back in the day, there was no restriction on number of wives. So he had 99 wives. And you know, back in the day, if you know, you know like kings and their harems, and they had like all these, these wives live in the palace and things like that. So he had a lot of wives. And so he sees from his balcony, he sees this woman, and he says, that's going to be my hundredth wife. Only to find out that that belongs to, it's, she's the wife of one of his generals. So he, this is the Israeli version, Ma'adullah, sends that general off to wars in an exposed position where he knows he'll get killed so he can marry her. That's the Israeli version. That's also been recorded in some of our classical tafasir. Unacceptable. Why? Because that's outright evil. There's murder. There's zina. There's all kinds of stuff here. That's just not appropriate for a prophet. We know better about prophets. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Then there's the other, the milder version of this. That some Ahlul Sunnah have taken. And that is based on the idea that prophets are innocent of sin, but that has to be qualified. If they are incapable of sin, that that means they're angels. So what does it mean that they're innocent from sin, ma'asum al khata, but they're still not angels? What's the, what's the thing in between that they are? They have temptation like Yusuf alayhi salam has. They can err, they can, they can get angry with their nation and leave like... Yunus alayhi salam. Like Yunus alayhi salam. So they can do things, and they can have thoughts, and they can have temptations, and they can even have the waswasa of shaitan, possibly shaitan can come and say something to them. It's not like shaitan has been blocked from talking to them. But they're protected in that even if they hear the waswasa of shaitan, Allah has given them the strength or the protection to not act on that waswasa, or to prevent them from being influenced by that waswasa. So that's the, that's the isma of prophets. That in, in some aspects they're just like us. In other words, they hear temptation too. They have, they're human beings like we are, etc., etc. But what, the only difference between the, us and them is, when we hear the waswas of shaitan, what ends up happening? Evil deeds. It turns into action. With them it never turns into action. The waswasa is impossible to avoid, but the action is always, you know, it's, it never happens. So they use that in this story to say that perhaps... The thought came in the mind of Dawud alayhi salam about this woman who's married. Just the thought came. And as a result, Allah sent these as a lesson. He wasn't going to do anything, but even the thought wasn't good enough for it, it wasn't becoming of a prophet and therefore this was said. Even that I find, personally I find problematic. I don't necessarily agree with that position. I, I'm very happy and I, my heart was very content with the explanation offered by Dr. Fadl Salih Hassan al-Rai. Who says that the first place we should look for an explanation of the Qur'an is the Qur'an's clear language itself? 
The Qur'an itself possesses the ultimate reminder. So let's look inside the Qur'an itself. The thing of it is, there, 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 there are already, as I've told you the story, there's already a few things we've passed through that should have caught our attention. One, a huge number of people has walked in. Two, fafazia, he's thrown off. Now a judge, in order to make judgments, has to be calm. If a judge is under pressure, if a judge is stressed out, if a judge, for example, is going through a divorce, and he's a divorce court judge, it's not a good thing. Because and if she's a woman, anybody coming into divorce court, that man's going to get it. Because she is going through a divorce herself. You understand? A judge has to be emotionally calm, with no pressures on him. There's already a problem with him as a judge in this situation, because when they walked him, they what? Terrified him. They terrified him. He's not in his right state of mind. فَفَزِعَ This is important to understand. Because فَزِعَ actually has to do with قُدْرَةَ uh, الْعَقْلِ The capability of understanding, the capability of making judgments is impaired because of the word فَزِعَ Now, the other thing is, even though they said, don't worry about it, we're just here about a case, does that mean he's completely not worried about it anymore? No. In my mind, from what we can see, from what we can perceive in the surah, he would rather these guys get out of here as soon as possible. So let me just quickly do their thing so they can leave. There's a problem though. What, there's two people that are at odds with each other, two brothers. As we listen to the story, and listen, قَالَ لَقَدْ ظَلَمَكَ بِسُؤَالِ نَعْجَتِكْ إِلَى نِعَاجِهِ You have wronged him. He's wronged you by asking you for your sheep to add to his own. وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْخُلَطَاءِ لَيَضْغِي بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ And there are so many خُلَطَاء خلطاء means people that are intermingled with each other, business partners, you know, relatives, people that work together, people that are hand in hand, deal with each other a lot, like siblings that live together in the same room, keep, wrong, keep having fights with each other, people that go to work together, keep, keep getting on, stepping on each other's toes. When people are inter, you know, uh, interacting with each other a lot, they're called خلطاء. خلطاء literally to mix, like you're in the same drink, you're mixed together. When that happens, they end up wronging one another a lot. This is, this is normal. People get on each other's nerves when they're together. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ With the exception of those who truly believe and, and do righteous deeds. Now, you know, you have a brother. Your brother moved out of the house. Your brother went, you know, somewhere else to study Islam or, you know, go to college or whatever. And you miss your brother, you love him, and you talk to him once in a while, etc., etc. But he came back. When he came back, everybody cried, you gave him a hug, etc., etc. Three hours later, you're fighting. Hey, what'd you do with my room? Well, you weren't here. What? So when I died? And then... Because, you know, there, there's people that when they're, when they're mixed in together, then it doesn't take long before they start fighting. Allah says, well, except people are really man, they can hold it in. وَعَمِلُوا صَالِحَاتِ وَقَلِيلُ الْمَعَمْ And how few those are. That brand of believer, how few those are. Now, basically he already passed his verdict. And his verdict is, the guy, the poor shepherd wins, and the rich shepherd loses. There's already a major problem. Can you figure out what it is? He didn't listen to both sides. He didn't even hear what the other guy had to say. He's rich, he must be wrong. We've actually learned this before. Musa a.s. learned this lesson the hard way in Surah Al-Qasas. Two guys are fighting. هذا من شيعته وهذا من عدوه والعدو يبغي على الآخرين دائما فربما يبغي الآن the, uh, This one's from his group, the Israelites. This one's a Coptic from the Egyptians. Who did he side with? The Israelite, even though the Israelite was the criminal. Because he figured these guys, I mean, they tend to do that. Rush to judgment. But Dawud alayhi salam rushed to judgment. Now we understand why he rushed to judgment. Because he wants them. Out of there, he's terrified. And the moment he passed his verdict, they disappeared. Poof. Now the Israeli version of the story, the moment they disappeared, he realized, yes, I have 99 wives, I shouldn't be thinking about the 100th. That's what Allah is teaching me. That's to me still, Wallahu alam is unacceptable. Rather, the moment they disappeared, وَظَنَّ دَاوُدُ وَنَّمَا فَتَنَّاهُ And Dawood, the thought came to Dawood that we're testing him. As he was talking, in the middle of his verdict, he's like, oh... Oh, I was being tested, wasn't I? فَاسْتَغْفَرَ رَبَّهُ Then he asked forgiveness of his master. وَخَرَّ رَاكِعًا And he fell into rukur. خَرَّ رَاكِعًا also implies he fell on his knees. 
to put pressure on your knees by your hands or just to fall on your knees. Hararakyan wa anab and he returned back to Allah. He made tawbah to Allah. I don't have the markings in this digital mushaf. It's an ayah of sajda, is it not? Let's make sajda, inshaAllah ta'ala. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فغفرنا له ذلك وإن له عندنا لزلفا وحسن مآب يا داود إنا جعلناك خليفة في الأرض فاحكم فاحكم بين الناس بالحق ولا تتبع الهوى فيضلك عن سبيل الله إن الذين يضلون عن سبيل الله لهم عذاب شديد شديد بما نسوا بما نسوا يوم الحساب رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحن العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We're still in the middle of the story of Dawud عليه السلام and now Allah Azza wa Jal says to us, فَغَفَرْنَا لَهُ Then we forgave him. ذَلِكْ We forgave that for him, meaning that, that rush to judgment. وَإِنَّ لَهُ عِنْدَنَا لَزُلْفَ And truly he did have a real great honor and status with us. In the previous surah we saw that Allah told people of elite status and wealth and power that your, your, your money and your children, doesn't, they don't give you zulfa with Allah. They don't give you status with Allah. And so the question arises, if that doesn't give you status, well, what does? And so this surah keeps on repeating, Here's the, here are the kind of people that get status with Allah. So it actually answers the question left in the mind of a reader from the previous surah. وَحُسْنَ ma'ab, And the, the most beautiful place to come back to, ma'ab is from Aba Ya'ubu, to keep coming back to something. And from the same word we get awab, which is what we already read. So husna ma'ab, what a beautiful place, the most beautiful place for him to come back to. In other words, Dawud alayhi salam's palace is waiting for him in Jannah. Ya Dawudu inna ja'alnaka khalifatan fil ard. Dawud, no doubt we have made you a khalifa, someone who will leave a legacy behind, someone who will have one after the other follow him. Khalifa also means someone given a lot of responsibility in the land. Fahkum bainan nasi bil haq. Then make decisions between people with justice. You see, even here, we've made you a khalifa, make judgments between people fairly. See, he wasn't. If, if he was the culprit as is suggested, then the idea would be you be fair. Judge yourself or, and you know, be fair in your own matters. وَأَقْسِطْ Be fair yourself. But here Allah is giving an, uh, uh, him advice not as a person but as a judge. Be a good judge. Judge between people with justice, with purpose, with truth. وَلَا تَتَّبِعِ الْهَوَىٰ And don't follow whim. Don't go on a whim. Al-Hawa. فَيُضِلَّكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ It'll mislead you from the path of Allah. So the path of Allah is not just what feels right, the path of Allah is what's based on haqq, on evidence, on truth, and hearing both sides out, and never just go by a gut feeling and pass a judgment without examining all the evidence. Because a lot of times what your, what your first assumption might be is completely wrong. فَيُضِلَّكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَضِلُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ No doubt those who are off the straight path, off the path of Allah, they are lost from the path of Allah. لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ بِمَا نَسُوا They will have a painful punishment because of what they forgot. Because the ma here is actually مَا مَسْطَرِيَ بِأَنْ نَسُوا It's like that. بِمَا نَسُوا Because of what they forgot or because of the fact that they forgot. Now, <coughs> the word عَنْ here, يَضِلُّوا عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Suggest that somebody was going on the path, and then they veered off the path. They lost their way. So they were already on track, and there was no reason they should have taken a turn this way or the other. They shouldn't have changed their course, their lifestyle. بِمَا نَسُوا يَوْمَ الْحِسَابِ On account of what they forgot, what they overlooked. I told you about the word نَسِيَا, not just forgetting, but actually also to overlook something, to neglect something. To, you know how we say, forget that guy? You know, like we don't care about him, we neglect him. وَمَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاءَ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا بَاطِلًا We didn't create the sky and the earth and whatever is between them without a purpose. Batil. Batil is the opposite of haqq. Judgments should be made with haqq because the universe was not created with batil. This concept is a very deep philosophical thing. You know there are other religions in which they talk about getting in touch with nature. You know, and you know, Zen and like Buddhists and things like that. And they think about the wisdom in nature. 
Quran does that in a, in a way that I don't know of any other religion that does. Allah Azza wa teaches us the skies have been created, they haven't been created without a purpose. And that, because you're constantly exposed to the sky, you're constantly reminded that you also have a purpose. The sky is the ultimate reminder of purpose. If someone says, I don't know, nobody ever gave me a sense of purpose in life, the sky is it. The skies and the earth were not created pointlessly. ذَلِكَ ظَنُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا That is the assumption of those who disbelieve. فَوَيْلُ لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنَ النَّارِ Then the worst form of punishment, the worst possible imaginable punishment is for those who disbelieved made of fire. مِنَ النَّارِ Meaning its, its component is fire. أَمْ نَجْعَلُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ كَالْمُفْسِدِينَ فِي الْأَرْضِ This is a very important ayah. It seems very simple when you read it. Are we going to make the... Uh, did we, uh, is it the case that we've made those who believe and those who do good deeds, like the, those who cause corruption in the land? أَمْ نَجْعَلُ الْمُتَّقِينَ كَالْفَجَّارِ or are we going to take the people that have taqwa who protected themselves and make them like those who explode, meaning those who do whatever they want to do? Now in this ayah, well, it's tied to the previous discussion. First of all, judging things fairly. Then the skies were created with purpose and for fairness and justice. Now Allah says, now imagine for a moment that that's not the case. That the skies and the earth don't have a purpose. And by the way, the purpose is, your purpose is reached when you reach your end goal. Isn't that the case? When you say, I've met my purpose, it means I've met my goal. What's the goal of the skies and the earth? To one day be torn apart. They're inching towards that goal. So that the day of judgment can be established. That is their final goal. That's where they're headed. And finally, Allah will give them permission to pursue their goal. That's why Allah says, وَأَذِنَتْ لِرَبِّهَا وَحُقَّتْ Allah gives permission to the earth to do what it's been wanting to do all along, to meet its purpose, to be flattened so that judgment day can be raised. So, if that's their purpose. Now there's a person on the earth, many people, if not most people on the earth, who live a life of no purpose. They say there is no afterlife. There is just eat, sleep, have some fun and die. That's all there is. Now, if that was the case, then all of us would be the same. Somebody who's praying, somebody who's staying away from temptation, somebody who says, I can't eat this and I can't eat that because it's haram, I can't look there because it's haram, I can't go there because I can't do that, and I have to, I can't just do whatever I want with my time, here are times that are specified for my prayer, I can't just pick any career I want, I have to be within these certain codes and these certain guidelines. Compare that to a person, this is الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ كَالْمُفْسِدِينَ The guy says, you know, there are people in this world who say, take whatever you can. Seize whatever opportunity you can. If you can get away with a crime, why not? You know? <coughs> there are, why, why do most crimes, crimes happen when there's riots happening? People figure, not going to get caught. Cops are all busy. The worst kinds of crimes happen during riots. Even normal people that aren't criminals usually resort to that because there's no sense of accountability. Allah says, without the concept of the afterlife, then all of these people stand the same. So without the afterlife... You can, there is no one better than the other. And so you are saying that God is unfair. That Allah Himself is unfair. There has to be, the Akhirah itself is what distinguishes the criminal from the righteous. That's, that's what gives them purpose. Otherwise, why am I making salat? Why am I praying? Why am I staying away from haram? Why am I missing out on what everybody else that's immersed in haram says, wow, that's so good. You know, when I was younger, I used to see the McDonald's commercial with the burger. You know, he's like, oh. now you know I'm Zubiha. Nah. I don't pass judgment. But I'm saying, if we were taught you can't eat it, then I'm looking at it like, man, how come we don't make it like that? They make it look so good. I'm probably, I'm pretty sure it tastes like paper, but still, you know, you, you hold yourself back from things. How can they be the same? I mean, I'm najalu muttaqina. People who protect themselves, kalfujar, fajr actually literally means explosion. The explosion of light in the morning is fajr prayer. Fajr is someone, the guy who bursts out in sin. He just does anything he wants. He has no restraints, no, no breaks on him. This is a fajr. The plural of it is fujar. Like kafir becomes kuffar. Fajr becomes fujar. No restraints whatsoever. Kitabun anzal nahu ilayka mubarakun. Beautiful ayah. A magnificent book we've sent down to you. Mubarakun, translated as blessed. Now there's two dimensions of barakah. One dimension of barakah I talked to you about a lot. 
الزيادته في الخير. It, it brings out more good than expected. That's Mubarak. Meaning when you, when you stick to this book, more good will come to you than you even expect. It has the power to increase goodness in your life. That's one meaning. But there's another very beautiful meaning of the word Mubarak I haven't shared with you yet. And that is istikhraj al khair mimma yahmilu imkaniyatahu. To bring out the good from something that has the potential in it. Somebody has potential. You know, a scout sees a kid play basketball, he goes, you got potential. But it's raw. You got raw talent. I have to refine you. If I train you with the proper training, you could be amazing. The talent is already there, it has to be brought out. The good is there, it has to be brought out. The same way you have an intelligent student. Just because you have an intelligent student doesn't mean he's going to exercise his intelligence. Just last night I was giving some friends the example of an intelligent student I had last year. Extremely intelligent student. Extremely intelligent. But doesn't apply himself. I compare him to the guy that's you know, driving a really super fast car in a race. And he puts the foot on the accelerator just a little bit. And he gets ahead of everybody else. In like half a second, he's way ahead of everybody else. And now he sees he's like 10 miles ahead, so what does he do? Ah, relax. No, re- no need to floor it. They'll catch up soon enough. They catch up, they get ahead of him, and then he goes, maybe I should step on it just a little. And he puts a little bit on it, and he's ahead of everybody else again. That kind of a person doesn't apply it to himself. Figures, because he's working in relation to, he's comparing himself to who? Others. So if others are behind him, so he can relax. But a, a believer doesn't compare himself to anybody else. He compares himself to Allah's expectations. Which means, he floors it. Doesn't matter if he lapped around and came back and they're still on the first round. It doesn't matter. He's still, he's not gonna put, take his foot off the accelerator. He's gonna do whatever he can. He's gonna exhaust his potential. Now, Allah calls water, ma'un mubarak. Blessed water. You know what that means? Not just that it's full of blessings. But the seed has potential. The seed's got potential. Who brought that potential out? The water brought it out. It was always there, but it couldn't have come out without the water. That's why it's called ma'un mubarak. So, we have goodness in us. Human beings have goodness in them. Like a seed. This kitab is mubarak. It's like that water on that seed. It takes that goodness and brings it out. It brings it to its full maturity. That's kitabun ilayk, kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun. It's, it's gonna bring out the potential in you. It'll bring out the goodness in it, and to its full potential. That's when you can see, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ We created the human being in the best possible form. How's he gonna get to the best? You're not gonna be impressed with the seed, you'll be impressed with the tree. And that's why, look at the parable Allah gives of the person of La ilaha illallah. The human being that embodies La ilaha illallah. كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ أَصْلُهَا ثَابِتٍ وَفَرْعُهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ Like a good tree whose roots are deeply rooted. And its branches go up into the sky. That's, this is Mubarak. And so, لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ Now how will he reach that potential? How is a person supposed to use this Qur'an to really bring out the good in him? Well, so that they can deeply reflect in order that they can deeply reflect on his ayat. Reflection in the Qur'an is going to bring out the ultimate good of, out of a human being. Really deep thought, immersing yourself in the word of Allah. وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُلُو الْأَلْبَابِ And so that the people that have sound minds can really take advice and make an effort to remember. Now, وَوَهَبْنَا لِدَاوُدَ سُلَيْمَانِ and for Dawood, we granted the gift of Sulaiman. Now you say, every child, every father is granted the gift of a child. So what's so special about Allah saying the special gift of Sulaiman was given to Dawood? Because this boy is not like other boys. This son is not like other sons. Something special about him. That's why he's called a gift. Not just because he's a child, but there's something unique about this child. So let's see what the, the first quality Allah chooses to describe is. نِعْمَ abdu innahu awab. What an awesome slave he was. What an awesome servant of Allah he was. Ni'ma al-abd. Innahu awwab. And no doubt he used to keep on coming back. Just like the dad is described as awwab, he's described. Son is just like the father, and what an awesome slave he is. So what an awesome slave of Allah makes the father proud. That my, my son is going to leave a sadaqah jariyah for me when I go. 
This is the real gift of Allah, to leave a righteous son behind, righteous, righteous daughter behind. إِذْ عُرِضَ عَلَيْهِ بِالْعَشِي When something was brought before him, presented before him, between the hours of Dhuhr and Maghrib, Al-Ashi. Something was brought before him. مَا بَعْدَ الظُّهْر إِلَى الْمَغْرِبِ Whatever comes between Dhuhr and Maghrib is called the hours of Ashi. Uh, now what is brought before him? As-Safinat. Safin. Jam'u Safin. وَهُوَ الْجَوَادِ الْعَرِيقِ الْأَصِيلِ Safin means some thoroughbred, really elite brand of horse. So he has an army, we already know about his army, Sulaiman's army, we know he's got people in it, he's got jinns in it, and he's got birds in it, but the cavalry is a really important part of any ancient army, so the cavalry is these branded horses, elite horses. And usually these kinds of horses are not used for battle, they're used for show, races. You don't want to use those expensive horses in battle, because in battle what, do you, what happens? You get killed. But al jiyad the really super fast ones, Jihad are the super fast horses, the Ferrari horses of that time. And he's got an army of them. So he's just, and, and they're presented before him because in the afternoon he goes on an inspection. He goes on, you know, the, the people who work with horses, they like to check on their face, they slap their legs a little, see if he's eating okay and things like that. He's, done, he's doing an inspection of his army, of his horses. So he's doing that and there's a lot of them. So he's busy. And what happens is, in the middle of doing all of this, he loses track of time, and the, the Salat of Ashi, now what Salat is between Dhuhr and Maghrib? Asr, the Salat of Ashi is Asr, which is Allah calls as Salat al-Wusta. He missed, he missed uh, 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 Asr prayer. A similar thing happened to the Prophet wasallam in the Battle of Ahzab. Uh, in the middle of the, the keeping caution and guard in Ahzab, the Muslims, including the Prophet ﷺ, missed the Asr prayer and it was qada on him. And he cursed the kuffar as a result of missing the Asr prayer. Now why do you miss Asr prayer? That's just, yeah. So anyhow, now by the way, if he's got a cavalry, when a cavalry is presented, and when would the king take the time to check the horses? Think about that. The king before, I mean, does it normally, does the king go out and check all the horses? No. When would a king do that? Especially a king like Sulaiman, who's got armies. Before they're about to go into battle. And the battle they're going to go into is also for the sake of Allah. They're going to go into battle for the sake of Allah. But, this battle cannot take you off of the priority of Salat. In other words, there's different kinds of services to Allah. There's a service you're going to do that is actual religious worship. Salat, Saul. Hajj, most importantly Salat, most centrally in the life of a Muslim, Salat, the constant fixture. Okay, but then you're working on some other stuff. You're working on a da'wah convention, you're working on fundraising for a masjid, you're working in an Islamic school, you're making a curriculum for something, you're, that's also Islamic work, it's also for the sake of Allah, you're learning something, you're studying tafsir, whatever you're doing, you know, you're listening to a lecture. Those are also acts of worship, it's not like they're not acts of worship. But, and so what he's doing, even when he's checking on his, those horses before they go into battle, and that's his, that's his greatness as a, gender, as, a, as a leader, that he doesn't sub-appoint that, he wants to make sure that's the case himself, because he's not going to be riding those horses, who is? His soldiers are. So his soldiers' lives depend on these horses, so they're presented to him because he cares about his soldiers. So he's checking on these horses. Now, فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَحْبَبْتُ حُبَّ الْخَيْرِ He said, I have fallen in love with the, the love of good. Al-Khayr here means, well, for the Arabs, they understood this very well. You know, in Surah Al-Adiyat, the Surah of thoroughbred horses that go into battle, وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٍ His love of good is intense. Good, to them, the first thing that, if you tell the Arab, have a picture in your head of the awesome thing, the awesome good thing, a good thing. That what's when you say the word good, what comes in your head? He's thinking an amazing horse. This is what he's thinking. And by the way, you can tell, you know, Safin, the elite brand of horse. You can tell them because when they stand, they stand on three legs, and one of their legs is bent like this. You ever see a picture of a horse like that? So his leg is up like this. It means it's on standby to run. So the elite branded horses. That's why they're called Safin, that's their unique feature, they stand on three legs. 
as though they're ready to go. As though they're ready to go. So he says, I'm, I'm so busy, this love of good, عَنْ ذِكْرِ Rabbi, it took me away from remembering my master. I had so much love for it that it took me away from remembering Allah. عَنْ ذِكْرِ Rabbi. حَتَّى تَوَارَتْ بِالْحِجَابِ Until she hid away in, in, the, in the cover. Hijab, the cover. Who's she? The sun. Until the sun hid away in the cover. Hatta tawarat bil hijab. So he looked at the sun, he goes, it's not there anymore. Oh, so the scene is, he's checking on the horses, and we're going to see in the next ayah, you know, how he was checking on the horses, because that's important too. And then as he's checking on them, he looks up and the sun is gone. And he goes, how could I be doing this? And you can imagine if there's hundreds of horses in the middle of them, you don't really look up at the sky. And the horses are taller than you, so you don't really see the light. Because you're so in, immersed in checking you know, their legs and things like that. So, he's, a, he's really upset about them disappearing, about the sun disappearing. رُدُّوهَا عَلَيْهَا Bring them back to me. فَطَفِقَ مَسْحًا بِالسُّوقِ وَالْأَعْنَاقِ then he started again mashan. He started, you know, mash is to gently tap over. Now, the Israeli version of this. He missed prayer. He got so angry. He had all of those horses called back. And he had all of them slaughtered. He, he stabbed all of them in the neck. Oh, first of all, he, he stabbed them in the, in the souk, which is the, the, the thigh. Okay? Or the, even actually the bottom of the foot of the horse, which is actually a weak portion of the leg. So he literally like cut them so that they could tor- he could torture the horses and then he stabbed their necks. He killed all the horses because he missed Salat. That's Israeli version. Quranic depiction, and some, some ulama have taken that too. But the word masih, like masih, masih, is to gently pour water over. To gently pour water over. And over the hair literally. And to do masih, like we do masih in wudu. Is that a violent act? For some people it is. For, for some, masa is pretty scary because like, patash, like, who just got slapped? No, this guy's making a wudu. Like, <laughs> in, uh, in the Batsha Rabbi Kala Shadid, you remember the ayah, like, what's this guy doing? You know? But anyhow, masa bisuqi wal anaq, what is Allah describing us? A Sha'rawi holds the opinion that yes, he felt bad about the salat. But, now that he, uh, we're taken back in this ayah to what he was doing before, how he missed it. He said, bring those horses back to me, and he checked every one of them and did mas'ah over every one of them. In other words, he excelled in this. He made sure that he passed his hand over every single neck, and every single leg of the horse he grabbed and said, okay, this is strong, this is good, this is good. This one seems a little injured, check on this one, etc., etc. And that's what got him to miss salat. But regardless of the fact that he missed salat, which he's going to make tawbah for, that's coming in the next ayah, Allah is telling us that what he did, he excelled in. He went out of his way to take care of those horses. Because that's also part of the mission with Allah Azza wa Jal. So what we're learning is you're, you better not miss salat, and you better not trivialize the work you're doing for deen. You better take both of them very, very seriously. وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّا Sulaiman. We had absolutely tested Sulaiman with a very difficult test. Now if you thought the controversy about Dawud alayhi salam and the Israeli versions are weird there, then the four variations that we find here take the cake. How did Allah test Sulaiman? Allah said, وَأَلْقَيْنَا عَلَىٰ كُرْسِيِّهِ جَسَدًا And we threw a body, a hollow body, jasad, a body that the, the, there's no more harakah left in it. In other words, it has a heart. It has internally, it may even be breathing. But it's no longer moving. It's paralyzed. Or it's about to die. That's a jasad. That's a jasad. So it may have some motion, but it's incapable of moving. This is the same thing. You know the calf that was made by Qarun? Or not, uh, uh, by Samiri? The calf that was made? It was also called jasadun lahu khuwar. Because it was vibrating. But it can't really move. It can't really move. So now we read this ayah. We tested Sulaiman, And how did we test him? We threw on his chair, on his throne, a body. We cast on his chair a body. Now a body that's paralyzed. What in the world does that mean? And thumma anab, then he made istighfar, then he made tawbah, then he turned back to Allah. Now what is this body and what's this story? There are four variations of the story. 
One of them is based on the text of the ayah itself. The other three are Israeliyat and other kinds of narrations. Number one, Israeli version. He makes the intention that he is going to get all 70 of his wives, wives pregnant in one night so that he can have 70 fighters in the cause of Allah. And then, and he didn't say inshallah. All 70 of them got pregnant. All of them had miscarriages except one. And that one that was born was paralyzed. And they brought him and they put him on his throne to teach him a lesson, basically. That's one version that you'll find even in classical literature. Then another version that he had another brother. Sulaiman Sam had another brother. And just like the son of Nuh alayhi salam, he rebelled against Dawood alayhi salam and Sulaiman alayhi salam. And he actually broke off from the kingdom and fought them and made his own kingdom. And this rebellion was going on for some time until Allah azza wa jal paralyzed him. And when he paralyzed him, because he was oppressing his own people, his people killed him and beat him, and they brought his dead body back to uh, Sulaiman his own brother's body. That's the second kind of version of this story that's found in the Seer literature. The third is that he had a child, but he wanted to protect the child, because he thought that the jinn, when they found out that Sulaiman has a son, they were terrified because Sulaiman had a pretty tight control over the jinn, so they wanted to kill his son so he doesn't grow up to be like his father and you know control them. So he wanted to protect his, uh, his son, so he ordered certain loyal jinns to keep him up in the clouds, that's the, and to feed him from the clouds. Very strange narrations. And he couldn't, and the child died, and then Allah, you know, then he was brought back to his throne. So each one of these are again found in Israeliyat, and that have been recorded in our classical works also. Some of them have even been narrated by, you know, some of the Aslaf. But you have to understand that we took, without as much discrimination from the people of the book before, we took from them a lot more than we do now. We just took it. And now we have the ability to scrutinize a lot more. The other thing is in tafsir literature, this is something you have to sit with a muhaddith and figure out. Something is narrated by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. For example, the Dawood story about, uh, about the uh, 99 wives, that story is reported to have also been transmitted by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. There's two issues there. One, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu may have heard it from the, one of the people of the book and just transmitted what they said. That's one possibility. The other possibility is a lot of things are said to have been from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, but the, when you actually engage in a scrutiny of the text and where it's coming from and what its origins are, then you find out that this is kind of suspect. You know, like how we do a scrutiny of hadith and we find out if it's sahih or not. The same way there has to be scrutiny done of what the sahaba say because what they say is transmitted to us in a chain and those chains are sometimes suspect. So just because you say, you see, qal ibn Abbas, ذَلِكَ لَا يَعْنِي أَنَّهُ قَال Just because you see it doesn't mean he's the one who in fact said it, but it's been attributed to him. It's just been attributed and that, that doesn't automatically become evidence that he said it. So it's a sensitive issue. Now the last interpretation that I didn't share with you. And that is, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّا سُلَيْمَانِ وَأَلْقَيْنَا عَلَىٰ كُرْسِيهِ جَسَدًا That we tested Sulaiman and we threw him, أَلْقَيْنَا who understood here, because Sulaiman is the subject here, we, we threw him on his chair as a paralyzed body, Sulaiman alayhi salam with so much control over so many armies and so many things, Allah Azza wa paralyzed him temporarily. And he couldn't do anything, he was just stuck in his, in his state. ثُمَّ أَنَا then Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, uh, then he returned back to Allah. Qala Rabbi Ghfirli. He said, Master, forgive me. Now that Allah re- re- revived his health, he, you know, and he missed the salat as a result of his busyness with the, with the horses, even though that was good reason. It's not good enough as far as Allah is concerned. And here, another very important point. Big people, their small mistakes become very big. Okay? The higher you are with Allah, the more you're under a microscope. So the prophets, alayhi salatu wasalam, even their like, understandable errors are not to be taken lightly by Allah Azza wa Us, we do those things that they considered sin. Those things for us are like an accomplishment. They're at just a different level. So, Allah forgave him. قَالَ رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَهَبْ لِي مُلْكًا and then he made the dua, and Allah grant me kingdom. In other words, Ya Allah, test me again, I'm ready for a retest. You know this zealous student, fails the test, 
Gets a 99. Comes back to the teacher and says, hey, so sad. Can you give me a harder test? I'll get 100 next time. Come on, I got this. I got this. He's got enthusiasm. And he wants to challenge himself. And he wants to show, show Allah even more obedience. And he says, Ya Allah, I will never let the affairs of my kingdom get in my way again. And give me a kingdom bigger than any other kingdom. Mulkan la yanbaghi li ahad bin ba'di. That won't even be appropriate for anybody after me. Because it will be too tempting. Give me the kind of power that if anybody else have it, has it, not only they shouldn't have it, it's not appropriate for them. La yanbaghi li ahad. Give me that kind of kingdom and I will show you that I won't be distracted again. Inna kanta al-wahhab, you are the ultimate giver, Ya Allah. But I want to earn my, my barakah back. I, I want to earn my status back. And because I was just taking care of some horses and I missed a salah, Ya Allah, forget horses. Give me armies that you haven't given anybody before. People have had horses before. Give me something else too. And I will not be distracted. This is his like turn, turning back to Allah with an enthusiasm. With a zeal. So he's not depressed with Allah. He says, Ya Allah, I'm ready. Let's do this. So, what does Allah do? فَسَخَّرْنَا لَهُ الْرِيحِ So we made the wind subdued to him. Did you know that the word reeh in the Qur'an is used for punishment? Riyah is used for reward. The plural of reeh is riyah. When the wind blows this way and this way and it's heading in multiple directions, the breeze comes calmly and goes the other way. This is riyah. Rih is wind coming from this town and it's heading over to this town and it's heading over to that town and wherever it goes, it has destruction. Rihun Asif. Allah says, we subdued even the strongest hurricane winds for him. Tajribi amrihi. That would flow smoothly by his command. Ruha'an. Ruha'an yani lina. Na'ima. Softly. Slowly. Steadily. Which is the opposite of what Rih does. That's the quality of riyah, not riyah. But even the strongest winds were slowed down for him. So a hurricane's coming, and then it calms down by the time it gets to Dawud Islam. And Dawud Islam says, speed up again. And it speeds up again. This is the power Allah gave him. This is a power that Allah Azza wa did not grant anybody else. To this day, we're terrified of hurricanes. In the Midwest of this country, how much destruction comes? I mean, the, we are technologically now more advanced than ever in human history. We can tell storms coming, we can see clouds from satellites, we can project the direction of clouds. It's crazy what we can do. You know, the storm is 13 minutes away, it's 18 minutes away, it's going to touch down over here. Oh my God. We have all of that technology. But at the end of the day, can we slow down a tornado? Can we t- change its course? SubhanAllah. Rukha'an. Haythu asab. Wherever he may strike it. Wherever it may strike, you can slow it down and, and, and tame it. So, you know, we just learned about taming horses. And now we're learning about taming winds. And this parallel exists in the Qur'an. Allah sometimes talks about winds like He talks about horses. Like horses go wild, winds go wild. Like horses can be tamed, winds are tamed. Well, the, the, this subject reaches its climax in Surah Al-Mursalat. When we get to Surah Al-Mursalat, you see the parallel between winds and horses. وَالشَّيَاطِينَ and on top of that, Allah even gave him control over shayateen. Now, the army of Muslims are Muslims. But the army, and Allah didn't even say, well, jinn. He said the evil jinns. Even the evil jinns, were, he, Allah gave him power over them. The ones that don't want to obey him. Why would an evil jinn want to obey a prophet? They're the enemies of prophets. They're the enemies of prophets. But this, these shayateen, these devils, the evil jinns, even they were given in the hand, in the control of Dawud Ali Sam, and what would he make them do? Banna and he would put them to construction work. Banna. Wahawas. And he would make them go diving. He, they were his submarines. They would he would take make them go get the pearls from the bottom of the ocean or get the treasures or go fishing or whatever. He'd make the jinns do that. The evil ones. The evil ones. وَآخَرِينَ مُقَرَّرِينَ فِي الْأَصْفَادِ And there were others that were so evil, they had to be kept chained, joined together and chained. Asfad are chains, and then you have, sometimes you have soldiers that are, there's ten soldiers and they're all chained together. That's مُقَرَّنِين. So these jinns, some of them are kept that way. هَذَا عَطَاؤُنَا That's our grant. فَمْنُونَ Then you can benefit people with them. In other words, these God shayateen that are going and doing His bidding, and by the way, if he goes into the ocean, can you run away? Think about that. If he dives into the ocean, can you run away? Sure. 
But he's been given control by Allah over shayateen. They can't run away, they have to come back. And then he keeps some of them in chains for like extra stock if he needs. You know how you have a weapon stash? He's got a jinn stash. So if he needs an extra cavalry to come out of there, just let's go. Get to work over there. هَذَا عَطَاؤُنَا That's our grant. This is our grant. From them. Then benefit people with it. All this technology I've given you, this unseen technology, the jinns, the winds, this weaponry that I've provided you, benefit people with it. From nun. Oh, I'm sick. Or you can hold on to it if you think it's, it's going to corrupt people. If you let people have it, and they might get messed up with it, then hold back. بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ Without any restrictions. This is going to be without you. This is entirely up to you. I'm leaving the discretion to you. You know what this غَيْرِ حِسَابٍ at the end tells you? How much trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in Sulaiman alayhi salam. That you know, you give him so much authority, and then you say to him, whatever you want to do, it's up to you, you're, and you're not going to be held accountable. بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ There's not going to be a حِسَابٍ on you. You use your discretion, I trust you. Subhanallah. That's the trust Allah put in Sulaiman alayhi salam. That's why taking those other kinds of narrations that seem to be conflicting with the personalities of the prophets, it's difficult to accept. It becomes difficult to take. Wallahu ta'ala ahna. The other, the last comment I want to make about this ayah, and this concept, is that technology, Allah subdued it for him. And what were they doing with that technology? What was he doing with winds? I mean, just ask yourself that question. What, has that been answered already for us? What was he using winds for? Yeah, to take a month's travel and make it the travel of a morning. So he was doing it for high speed travel. What was he using jinns for? Undersea. Construction. So there, he had advanced advantages in technology of transportation, construction, and digging the treasures of the earth. Are we living in a time where these technologies are somewhat accessible to us like never before? We are. We are. But are they in the hands of someone like Sulaiman who has discretion, you could benefit people with it, or you could hold on to it, you won't be accounted for, or are we, having these tech, are we seeing these technologies in the hands of irresponsible people that are not only plundering and looting the earth, they're also bankrupting humanity at the same time. You know, it's one thing that you're digging the treasures of the earth to save humanity, it's another that you're digging the treasures of the earth and humanity is starving more than ever before in history. That's un- 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 unjustifiable. It's unjustifiable. By the way, so he allowed some interaction of the jinn. Of course, jinn are construction workers. That doesn't mean jinn are the only construction workers. They're human construction workers too. So you're working side by side with a jinn. There's some interaction. And then are there messed up people in society? Sure. And so they start learning stuff from jinns. Hey, so you're a jinn, right? Yeah. So can you teach me some stuff? Like, what do you do? Like what? Like, you know, like magic or like, how do you? So they start messing around with each other, the people and the jinn, because they're working in the same complex. And so what do we read in Baqarah? That the people were learning magic. And then who had to come as a, as a test? The, the angels had to come. Harut and Marut had to come. You know? So, but, but, so things are coming together. Bits and pieces that we need to know are coming together. So هذا عطاؤنا فمنن أو أمسك بغير حساب وإن له عندنا لا زلفا and he had a really close high standing with us. He had great closeness and high standing and status with Allah. وحسنما آب and what a beautiful place to go back to. Basically the same status as Dawud عليه السلام. وذكر عبدنا أيوب and mention our slave Ayub. إذ نادى ربه when he called on his master إني مسني الشيطان بنصب وعذاب no doubt shaitan has touched me with exhaustion and punishment. Now this is a difficult ayah to understand if we don't dig a little deeper. You see, sickness and health comes from Allah. And he's saying, and we know that Ayub his, his major test was his sicknesses. He had a disease of the skin, he had rashes and openings in his skin, and some even say that there were insects crawling in and things like that. Until some point his family tried to take care of him, his wife tried to take care of him, his family tried to take care of him. But it got to a point where they couldn't handle it. So they left him. And there's a scene before they left him too that's going to come in this surah. We're going to see a conversation between him and his wife. It's alluded to. 
Um, that's what's found in narrations. So now, he, uh, Ayyub alayhi salam calls on Allah but says, Shaitan has caused me exhaustion. You know what that means? When a person is sick, then they get a lot of waswasa from Shaitan. Why, does, why is Allah doing this to you? What did you ever do to deserve this? How about you try this special taweez? How about you try this special potion? I heard if you do this, this, this uh, exercise, this spiritual exercise, or you try this like amulet, it helps a lot. When a person is sick, they're desperate. And if their situation is getting worse and worse and worse, they're willing to try anything. And when they're willing to try anything, who sees that as an opportunity? Shaitan does. And he comes and he tries to do what's what's at that time. Now Ayyub a.s. situation is deteriorating and deteriorating. And it's deteriorated so much he's got nusub. Nusub means he can't even stand up anymore. He's that exhausted. Wa'adhab. And he's constantly in pain. He's constantly feeling the torture. And in that time, who keeps coming to him and suggesting things? Shaitan does. Try this potion. Try this, you know, this uh, cultish exercise. Try this ritual. Maybe it'll help you. It'll help, and one way or the other. One way or the other. And then we learn actually that a little bit later on, but I'll, I'll break the mystery for you. Shaitan wasn't actually coming to him. He was coming to his wife. And he told his wife, don't you love your husband? You should want him to be better. If you can somehow convince him to do what I'm asking you to do, asking to convince him, if he can even once say, I can cure him. Shaitan comes and says, I can cure him right now. If he just says, Shaitan cured me. He just has to say that. That's, that's all I want him to say. And his problems will disappear. So he comes to the wife. And the wife's been taking care of him for a long time. And she's desperate. So she comes to him and says, um, I had a thought. This wish came in my mind. This khatir came in my mind. This, this thought came in my mind. What do you think? You want to try it? I mean, nothing else has worked. And he sees it for what it is right away. And he got so angry at his wife, he said, I'm going to whip you a hundred times. That's the other thing about a person who's sick. You know, there's two situations now where a person, or actually three situations, there's, where they're very upset. You've got Dawud alayhi salam who got upset when people jumped into his quarters. You've got Sulaiman alayhi salam who got upset because he missed salat. Now you've got, you know, Ayyub alayhi salam who's really upset because his wife says something. And he says, I'm going to whip you a hundred times. Now he didn't mean it. He didn't really, it was just a spur of the moment. He said it. We'll see about that. But then he, when he made, finally turned this, made this dua to Allah, he found the most respectful way of saying it. He didn't even say, Ya Allah, sickness is hurting me. He's not saying that. He's saying shaitan is hurting me because I'm exhausted and punished. He didn't even say get rid of my exhaustion and punishment. Don't get rid of my sickness. Just get rid of shaitan. That's the part I can't handle. So the amazing patience of Ayyub Ali he didn't ask for healing. He just asked for shaitan to go away. It's awesome. That's, that's what makes him special. Now, Allah tells him, Urkud bi rijlik, strike with your feet. Get up on your feet and strike. Now, Nusul means he can't even stand. But Allah tells him to stand and stomp with his feet on the ground. Hadha mughtasalun, mughtasalun. As the moment you strike with your feet, water is gonna gush out. Water is gonna come out. And this water is mughtasal. It should be made, taken a shower with. Allah is telling him, giving him a special form of water when he showers with it. And it's cool, because he's burning with heat and fever. It's gonna cool him off, and it's going to get rid of his skin disease. It's gonna get rid of his problem. But perhaps the skin disease is manifesting on the skin, but the real virus or bacteria or whatever it is, is not on his skin, it's inside him. It's inside. So he needs not only a healing on the outside, he needs a healing on the inside. So Allah adds, wa sharab And drink it too. Because if you drink it, then the inside will be cleansed. So the outside is cleansed, and the inside is cleansed, and the burning torture, the burning torture of the fever is removed by the word barid. Wa wahabna lahu wa ahlahu. So he's, he's, he's healed. And we granted him and his family. We gave him back. Wa wahabna lahu ahlahu. We gave him his family back. His family came back to him. Wa mithlahum. And another like them. So he had more children. Ma'ahum. Along with them. Or he married another. Rahmatam minna. 
This was all as a mercy from us. Wa dhikra li ulil albab and a powerful reminder for those who truly use their intelligence and those who truly have sound minds. Wa khud bi yadika dhughtan and hold a bundle of straws in your hand, a bundle so big that you can't close your fist. Urdu me kate jharu. That's jharu. It's a bundle of straws that you use to sweep. Allah says, hold it, hold it with your hand. Fadrib bihi and hit with it. Strike with it. Wala tahnath and don't break your oath. Don't break your oath. What oath? What did I tell you? I'm gonna whip you a hundred times. Allah says, take a hundred straws, tie them together, and just hit her once with it, and your, your oath is okay. You're clear. Okay, so that's the expiation. And this is a matter of a prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. And if one prophet can be told to slaughter, the, you put a knife to the neck of his child, another can be told to hit his wife with a broom. Okay. Because of because she tried to convince him to follow the shaitan. But now she came back, she made tawbah. But it, her tawbah has to be expect, accepted in this world. You see, two things happened here. One, he fulfilled his word. Two, now she's not answerable for that in akhirah. So Allah says, وَلَا تَحْنَثْ And don't take back your oath. Don't break your oath. Hinth in Arabic, one of the words for sin. Or a false oath. oath. Or hanatha fil yameen. Don't to, to, to fall short of fulfilling the requirements of a pledge that you made or an oath that you made. You know, for normal human beings, when they speak out of emotion, Allah says, you won't be held to account. Allah told us already, لا يؤاخذكم الله باللغب في أمانكم Allah will not hold you to account for just you running your mouth and saying, Wallahi, I'm going to beat you, punch you in the face. Allah won't hold you to that because you didn't mean it. A spur of the moment kind of thing. He didn't really mean it. We can tell that Ayyub Aisham doesn't really mean it. But he, he's a prophet. And the prophet's even small slip is a big deal. So he has to expiate for it. And so Allah revealed to him how to expiate for that. Inna wajadnahu sabiran. No doubt we found him patient. Ni'm abd What an awesome slave he was. Innahu awab. He continually kept turning back and turning back and turning back to Allah. This is a great passage for people that are suffering from sickness, and so many Muslims are, for them to study and reflect on. The, 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 the difficulties Dawud alayhi salam went through, and how he kept turning back to Allah, and how shaitan tries to get you in those times. And, and how you also end up saying things that you'll regret. How all of those things happen in sickness. وَذْكُرْ عِبَادَنَا Ibrahim wa Ishaq wa Yaqub. Mention our slaves, Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Yaqub, Ulil Aidi, Walabsar, that possessed great might also. These were strong messengers and had great insight, foresight. Inna akhlasnahum bi khalisatin. We had selected them and purified them and cleansed them with a special cleansing quality. One khalis, khalisa tamrabuta here means one particular quality. Lil huduth. Dhikraddar, which was the, the constant reminder of the last home. They would keep making mention of the final home. وَإِنَّهُمْ عِنْدَنَا لَمِنَ الْمُصْطَفَيْنَ وَإِنَّهُمْ عِنْدَنَا لَمِنَ الْمُصْطَفَيْنَ And they are in our close company, counted among those that were especially chosen. الأخيار, the best of them. The best of them. وَذْكُرْ إِسْمَعِيلِ Make mention of Yasa, Ismail and al Yasa. al Yasa is considered a contemporary later on uh, uh, that came in Sham. And he was a Khalifa of Ayyub alayhi salam. He came after Ayyub alayhi salam. We don't know much about him. Wa kifl which we had a conversation about before, not much is known about him either. Wa kullu min al-akhyar. And all of them are from the very best. And perhaps Allah mentioned these people's names and didn't tell us much about them. Because that's one of the reasons you would want to go to Jannah is to, Oh, so you're the kifl So what's your seerah like? Tell me all about it. You want to know these people. You want to get to know more and more about them. كُلُّ مِنَ الْأَخْيَارِ وَهَذَا ذِكْرٌ And all, هَذَا ذِكْرٌ This is all a remembrance and a reminder. وَإِنَّ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ لَحُسْنَ مَآبٍ And for people who really protected themselves, will be the best possible return. You see, the best possible place to go back was mentioned for the prophets one after the other. And now you're told, hey, you get to go hang out with the prophets. You get حُسْنَ مَآبٍ also. Jannati Adnin, the gardens of Adn. Allahu Akbar. How incredible these ayat are. Mufattahatan lahumul abwab. The doors are already widely opened for them. When you have a guest coming, and you know they're coming, you leave the door open. Allah says the gates of Jannah are already open. 
the garden of Aden, the Jannat of Aden, the gates مفتحة. Now, لم يقول مفتوحة. He didn't say they're just open. مفتحة. They're wide open. It's like, you know, it's a little bit open here, like maybe the, maybe the owner of the house accidentally he, he pushed the door but it didn't close all the way. It's still مفتوحة. But no, it's مفتحة. It's like both, both panels of the door are wide open on the side and the big sign inside says, come on in with your name on it. مفتحة. مفتحة لهم الأبواب. Especially for them, the doors are being, it's as though they're being held open also because it refers to a مفعول نائب الفاعل. مفتحة. Who's the مفتح? Who's holding it open? The, like those gates want to close, but the gates are being held open by the angels. And by the way, the exact opposite is true of Jahannam. The gates of Jahannam are always closed. That's a mercy of Allah, isn't it? The mercy of Allah is the gates of Jahannam are closed. And when you get there, then they're opened. Then they're opened. This is one of the miracles of the Qur'an that I will teach you about in Surah Al-Zumar. It's a miracle of the Qur'an. And what is the miracle of the Qur'an? In what word? The letter wow. Just wa. Just wa. And we'll talk about that when we get there. Inshallah ta'ala. مُتَّكِئِينَ فِيهَا يَدْعُونَ فِيهَا بِفَاكِهَةٍ They're reclining in it. You can just imagine them already. Since the doors are open, the mind goes, what's going to happen inside those doors? Now when you go in somebody's house, what's the first thing you do? Sit down. Muttaqeen, relax. Muttaqeen afiha. Yad'oon afiha. Now they'll start asking for stuff. This is not like, this is your own house. So you know when you go to a, when you go to a guest's house, you go to somebody else's house, and you're a guest, you don't ask, hey, can you, pani shani zara, epsi hai, apke paas ya. Aapke ghar mein ketchup khatam ho gaya. Right, you, you wouldn't do that to somebody else. I mean, I would do it, I have no shame, but like, you wouldn't normally do that to somebody's house. You go to somebody else and say, hey, so, uh, I mean, do you have like anything better or this was it? Wouldn't do that. But this is your house, man. You go to your own house, what do you do? Make a call. I call my kids. Hosta, is there any chocolate in the fridge? Check. How about you right there? I'm gonna kill you. Don't make me take an oath, because I have a broom. <laughs> okay. You start making a. You sit down like, hey, let's eat some Jannah food. I mean, I remember I asked about food, so let's have some food. Fakihatin kathira. Let's bring a lot of it. A lot of it starts coming. What about the drink? Wa sharab. And the drinks start flowing. Wa indahum qasiratu tarf atrab. And then in their company, there are going to be those shy spouses that keep lowering their eyes and sit next to them. Atrab, that are is similar, they're compatible. Just because she's beautiful, doesn't mean she has a good personality. She could be a monster. You can hate her guts. Just because she's pretty doesn't mean anything. They have to be atrab. They're the same age as you. They're compatible with you. They like what you like. They don't like what you don't like. They are, they're a perfect fit. They're a perfect fit. And that's sometimes not possible in this world. Even among sahaba. There's, inca- there's no compatibility sometimes. What story do we read about lack of compatibility? Zayd bin Zaynab, radiallahu ta'ala anhumah. There's no compatibility. That's okay. Jannah, total and absolute compatibility. And it's not artificial compatibility. You know, they make all these movies about relationships and soap operas and comedies and this and that. When they first meet each other, everything is perfect and things start going sour after a while, right? Well, in Jannah, you're with this lady forever. Forever. Ever, you ever seen the Lockhorns? You guys don't read newspapers, right? So, I don't know. Lockhorns is an old comic. It's old comic script. strip, And they're old husband and wife. And they're always sarcastic with each other. It's really funny stuff. But the point of all of it is, when you spend a lifetime together, you get on each other's nerves. You start saying stuff to each other, you can like, how could you say that? Like your parents do that. Your, your grandparents do that, they talk to each other like, oh my God, how could you just say that? Yeah, chara yaar, it's all good. I can say it, I've been with her 70 years. She can take it, and she'll respond, she'll fire back with another one. <laughs> you know? So this, but this is the opposite of atrab. They've learned to deal with each other. They roll with the punches. But atrab, everything is in compatibility. Everything is smooth. هَذَا مَا تُعَدُونَ لِيَوْمِ الْحِسَابِ This is what you were promised for the day of, of resurrection, the day of accounting. إِنَّ هَذَا لَرِزْقُنَا مَا لَهُ مِنْ نَفَادِ This is our provision. 
It does not have any end to it, any expiration to it whatsoever. Remember the word nafada? قُلْ لَوْ كَانَ الْبَحْرُ مِدَادًا لِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّي لَا نَفِدَ الْبَحْرُ قَبْلَا أَن تَنْفَدَ كَلِمَاتُ رَبِّي Tell them if the oceans were turned into ink to write the words of my master, the oceans would run dry. They would run out, they would expire. Nafad, the mustar of it. There is no expiration on this rizq. Hada, enjoy all of this. This is sometimes in Qur'an Allah does that hada. That's it. That's the stuff. That should hit the spot. وَإِنَّ لِلطَّاغِينَ لَشَرَّ مَآبٍ And for the rebellious, the worst possible place to go back to. جَهَنَّمَ يَصْلَوْنَهَا Jahannam they'll be thrown into. فَبِئْسَ الْمِهَادِ What a horrible cradle that hugs them it is. هَذَا Take it then. فَلْيَذُوقُوهُ Then they should taste it. حَمِيمٌ وَغَسَّاقٌ Taste what? It's a new sentence actually because it's marfu'a again. It's like there's istighnaf. What should they taste? And just like the taste doesn't go down the throat, the sentence cuts and goes, starts over again. And what is it? Hameem actually means boiling hot water. Boiling, boiling hot water with the bubbles being large. Wa ghassaq. Ghassaq, they say, you know, ghassaqat aynuhu. If, if the, the, the tears start flowing, any bodily fluids are ghassaq. And especially if they've left the body. Like pus, blood, tears, sweat. That's what they're made to drink. وَآخَرُ مِنْ شَكْلِهِ And another drink that can't even be described, but it's something like it. Azwaj, a whole categories of them. A whole array of horrible drinks. Whole cocktails of horrible drinks laid out for them. هَذَا فَوْجٌ Then they're told, hey, there's a whole multitude of people coming to join you. So you have, you know, in America we talk about overcrowded prisons. You ever heard of the problem? Overcrowded prison system, right? So the prison's already overcrowded, everybody's stuffed together. And the announcement is made, here's another one, here's another huge bundle of people being squished into hell. مُقْتَحِمٌ مَعَكُمْ They're gonna be stuck together with you. مُقْتَحِمْ يَعْنِي دَاخِلْ بِشِدَّةِ وَسُرْعَةِ Someone who jumps quickly into something. اِسْتِقْتَحَمَ To jump quickly onto something. Allah says at the end of Qur'an, فَلَقْتَحَمَ الْعَقَبَ وَمَا أَضْرَاكَ مَا الْعَقَبَ he didn't jump to the opportunity. He didn't leap on it. Iqtiham, to leap on something. But like in Hunaka Su'ad, there's a question. كَيْفَ يُسْرِعْ الدَّاخِلِ وَهُوَ دَاخِلِ إِلَى النَّارِ How can somebody leap into a fire? He's going into fire. He should be like dragged into the fire. How is he leaping? We're learning other places in the Qur'an. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, they are da'a, yuda'una da'a. They're pushed really hard. So it looks like they're leaping in. So here's another one, like the, 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 the guardian of hell opens the gate and makes the announcement. More coming through! And they're pushed in. And then the people at the bottom say, لا مرحبا بهم! They're not welcome here! When somebody comes to your house in Arabic, what do you say? مرحبا بكم! ترحيب! لا سعى ولا تحيا ولا تكريم! There's no room for them here! They're not welcome here! They won't be honored here! Why are they coming? Why do we need more? There's la marhaban bihim. Innahum salun nar. They're gonna be thrown in the fire. Allah says, absolutely they're gonna be thrown in the fire. I don't care if they're welcome or not welcome by you. Now the guys that on the bottom said, they're not welcome here. The guys on top heard it. Oh, we're not welcome? Qalu bal antum la marhaban bikum. They said, no, you. You're not welcome either. There's no space for you. Antum qaddam tumuhu lana. You're the reason we're here. You're the one, you were the ones ahead of us that set this whole place for us. You're the ancestors whose traditions we so proudly followed. Who we wanted to hold on to so strongly. You're our elders. You're those elders that in the beginning of this surah said to the Muslims, or to anybody who listens to the Prophet, Umshu, Get out of here. What are you listening to him for? Remember that you, you, you're the one who set the stage for us. فَبِئْسَ الْقَرَارِ Then what a horrible place to remain that is. قَالُوا رَبَّنَا مَنْ قَدَّمَ لَنَا هَذَا They would say then, Master, whoever, whoever got ahead of us in this, whoever took first, who was in the first ranks of the animosity against Islam, those people, فَزِدْهُ عَذَابًا ضِعْفًا فِي النَّارِ Give him double the punishment in the fire. قَالُوا مَا لَنَا This is what I told you is incredible, the sequencing of the Qur'an. Incredible. In the previous surah, you remember a conversation happened in Jannah? And they were friends hanging out together. And they said, there's someone missing. Where'd he go? 
and he finds out he, he finds out he's in hellfire. There's an equivalent conversation happening in hellfire in this surah. Same exact conversation, except it's flipped. Now it's happening among people who are burning together. Remember how you greet one another, akbala ba'duhum ala ba'di. You know, yatasa'al, you're asking each other questions, you're greeting one another. Oh my God, you're my grandfather, you're my grandfather's grandfather's grandfather who became Muslim, from Buddhist, back in Afghanistan. You're the one. Thank you. You're the one that migrated. You're the one. Oh my goodness, mashallah. Also, you lived at the time of the, you know, the British colonizers. You lived at that time? How was it back then? You're gonna... It's gonna be this meet and greet. And what is happening here? Another group is coming and instead of greet, being, them being greeted, they're being, La marhaban bihim, la marhaban bikum. It's your fault, it's your fault. And then, these leaders, especially these leaders who were so dismissive in the beginning of this surah, this surah, they say, Ma la, ma What's wrong with us? This is the Qur'an's version of time travel. You are being shown the exact event of the future right now. A conversation that will happen, I don't know when from now, when the earth is gone. And Jannah and Nar are out. And Allah says, this is all real. تَخَاصُمُ أَهْلِ nar. The debate and the vicious arguing against each other of the people of fire. And by the way, when the people of Jannah, even one person asked, I wonder what happened to them? Were their requests granted? Yeah. Here there's no mention of anything being granted. They just, we can't see them. Where do they go? Can't find them here. SubhanAllah. And they just, they're just left. They're abandoned. Allah says, this is for real. You think this is just a story? They're just there to scare you? This is actually happening. This debate is, is going to take place. قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا مُنْذِرًا You know what we're in the, between the lines where we, we told in, in these two surahs? You wanna, you're going to be in one of these two conversations. You are going to be in one of these two conversations. You pick. That's what we're being told. قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا مُنْذِرٌ Tell them, I'm just here to warn you. I'm just a warner. وَمَا مِنْ إِلَٰهٍ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And no one is to be worshipped and obeyed except Allah. الْوَاحِدُ الْقَهَّارِ The one, the dominant, the one that cannot be avoided. الْقَهَّارِ The undeniable. رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفَّارِ The master of the skies and the earth and whatever lies in between them. The ultimate authority. Authority because he has the power to punish. The authority to punish. الْغَفَّارِ But also the one that continually and repeatedly keeps on forgiving. قُلْ هُوَ نَبَأٌ عَظِيمٌ Tell them this is a huge bit of news. What you've just been told, the scene that you've been told, is no small thing. It's huge news. أَنْتُمْ عَنْهُ مُعْرِضُونَ you're still ignoring it. You're not taking it seriously. مَا كَانَ لِي مِنْ عِلْمٍ بِالْمَلَأِ الْأَعْلَى Tell them, I don't have any knowledge of the highest angels. إِذْ يَخْتَصِمُونَ When they have debates among themselves. This means two things. Uh, or the, 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 I'll just share with you the popular opinion because it's a stronger version, stronger opinion. And that is, الْمَلَأُ الْأَعْلَى are the highest angels. And even among the highest angels, there's a debate happening. We're learning that angels don't just obey Allah and whatever Allah commands them. That's true, there's more to them. They have personalities, they can think, they have intelligence, they have opinions. They never disobey Allah, that's something else. But they have opinions of their own and they can process things. And there's a difference of opinion among angels. Allah should just, I mean, Day of Judgment is just, should just come right now. These people should just be destroyed. Look at what they did with Muhammad today. I think they should just be killed. And the other say, no, 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 there's more time. There's more time. It's probably, you know, Allah has a plan and hasn't come yet. And they're having, the, like soldiers having a conversation about when the general is going to send them. Allah says, I have no access to that conversation, Allah tells His Messenger to say. I have no knowledge of the, the debates happening among the angels. I don't know. إِنْ يُوحَى إِلَيَّا إِلَّا إِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ The only thing sent to me is nothing but I am exclusively an obvious clear warner. إِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي خَالِقٌ بَشَرًا مِنْ طِينٌ Now we're going into the next, uh, last conversation of this surah. This is the last time the story of Adam alayhi salam will be repeated. The wisdom of the sequencing here, one of the aspects of that wisdom, is we just saw the end of humanity. We, we saw the end of humanity in if they follow the footsteps of, of shaitan. And now Allah is going to take us all the way back to the beginning of humanity, where this entire journey began. And how you ended up following the very thing your, fa- your first father was warned of. And you remember how in Jahannam Allah said, you are, you are, or not you, but the person is saying, you guys were ahead of us, you were our fathers, we ended up following you. 
And in this world, they argue, we're only going what our, we're only doing what our tradition says. Allah says, if you really want to follow tradition, just follow Adam. If you want to follow a father, then follow your real father, Adam alayhi salam. That there's a legacy you can t- hold on to. So that's the, the concluding remarks of the surah, inshaAllah ta'ala. We'll do that in our next halaqa. I'll give you a relatively shorter break. Barakallahu wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فإذا سويته ونفخت فيه من روحي فقعوا له ساجدين فسجد الملائكة كلهم أجمعون إلا إبليس استكبر وكان من الكافرين الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We're at the end of Surah Sad The 71st ayah إِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ When your master said to all of the angels إِنِّي خَالِقٌ بَشَرًا مِنْ طِينَ I'm about to create or I have, I'm determined to create a mortal being from clay, from wet soil فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ Then when I finally mold him, سَوَّى you سَوِّي is to balance something or to put finishing touches on something. You know, first you create something and then you refine it. Tasviya is the act of refining, balancing, making sure every end of it is even, things like that. So Allah says, for example, سَبِّحِ اسْمَ رَبِّكَ الْأَعْلَى الَّذِي خَلَقَ فَسَوَّى So He creates and then He puts finishing touches on it. فَسَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَقْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي And after the finishing touches are done, I, will, I blow into him of my ruh, فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ Then blow, then, then fall before him in sajda. فَسَجَدَ الْمَلَائِكَةُ كُلُّهُمْ أَجْمَعُونَ Then the angels, all of them, prostrated, fell into sajda before him, without exception. Now the كُلُّهُمْ and أَجْمَعُونَ is an usual combination. And what that tells you is, there were no exceptions to the angels making sajda. Iblis couldn't, fall, couldn't possibly have been a fallen angel according to the Qur'an. Has to be a jinn. And of course that's explicitly mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf. Kana min al-jinn. He was from among the jinn. Illa Iblis has takbara. Except Iblis, not so Iblis. That's why the word Illa is important to understand properly. Illa doesn't just mean except. Not so Iblis. He didn't do so. Istakbara, he tried to show his own greatness. He tried to be arrogant. Wakana min al-kafirin. And he had been... He had already been from those who disbelieved. قَالَ يَا إِبْلِيسِ مَا مَنَعَكَ أَن تَشْجُدْ He said, Iblis, what, what prevented you that you should do sajda? لِمَا خَلَقْتُ بِيَدَيَّ Why didn't you do sajda? What prevented you from doing sajda to the one that I created with both my hands? Now Allah says, you know, وَالسَّمَاءَ خَلَقْنَا بِأَيْدٍ We created the sky with hands, with our hands, plural. More than two. Then yad, like yadullahi, the hand of Allah. Yadullahi fawqa idihim, Surah Al-Fatih is going to come. The hand of Allah is above their hands. And now Allah says, both my hands. Now both my hands, of course, there are there's so many theological debates that come out of both my hands. What does Allah mean by both hands? Does Allah have two hands? And you know, and all of that. that to me, that entire conversation is pointless. There's no purpose, rhyme or reason to engage in that conversation. What Allah says is what Allah says. However, there are points of reflection. There, are, there is such a thing as, uh, you know, two hands, and if you look at the creation of Adam alayhi salam, it's done in two dimensions. There's, Allah says, أَلَا لَهُ الْخَلْقُ amr. Allah owns all of creation, and Allah owns the world of Amr. I talked to you about a comparison between the world of Khalq and the world of Amr before. And the only creature that is made of the world of Khalq and the world of Amr is... Adam alayhi salam, both sides, both hands, could possibly be one meaning of Allah created, or what, you, uh, you refuse to do sajda to someone that I created with both my hands, from the dimension of amr and the dimension of khalq. Allah ta'ala alam. Istakbarta, you've shown arrogance. Astakbarta, have you shown arrogance? Am kunta min al Or is it the case that you truly are from those who deserve that kind of height? Are you really... Are you just showing it? Or are you convinced that you are from them? Is that the reality you think you have? قَالَ أَنَا خَيْرٌ مِّنْهُ He said, I'm better than him. How defiant. Speaks to Allah directly like this. I'm better than him. 
خَلَقْتَنِي مِن نَارٍ وَخَلَقْتَ هُمْ مِن طِينٍ You created me from fire. You created him from dirt. Allah already mentioned, He did create us from dirt. But then He put His ruh in us. Then, fa fa sababiyya. Then as a result of the ruh, declaring the supremacy of the human being, the dirt itself is not enough. All other creatures were made from dirt too. The dirt is not enough. Then make sajda to him. He doesn't even acknowledge the existence of the ruh. Perhaps he doesn't know about it even. Or care for it. All he sees is clean. So, he doesn't see what's so great about the human being because he's just made of dirt. What a surprise. In modern science, when we don't see the, we don't acknowledge the existence of the ruh anymore, all we see ourselves is just another animal. We don't see what's so great about the human being. You know the Christians, to show the greatness of the human being in their theology, they even modified revelation and they even modified what Allah didn't even say, added things Allah didn't even say, like man is at the center of the universe. We never said that. The Christians said that because they said this is a way of honoring the human being. All the honoring the human being will ever need is already by account of the ruh. You don't need to be at the center of the universe to be honored. That's already there because Allah has blown into his, of his own ruh. Min ruhi means one of his special properties, one of his special creations, ruh, is what is blown into the human being. That's what honors us. Now, shaitan sees not, no big deal in the human being. And by the way, this is a huge aspect of guidance. To, to us honor, our, to honor ourselves. Allah says we honored the son of Adam. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. We honored the son of Adam. The ruh is what honors us. The denial of ruh is basically the degradation of the human being. And once you've degraded yourself and you start comparing yourself to animals, then that's what we're finding ourselves now. Do you know that you know, a lot of people that argue, for example, in favor of homosexuality, for instance, compare human beings to certain species of pigs or some species of monkeys? And say, it's found in nature. <laughs> I was like, wow. That's, that's the real denial of the soul. Now you're saying your behavior is justifiable because you're modeling yourself after animals. We begin with the premise that the human being is honored. And so, he didn't acknowledge the existence of the ruh. And what does he want humanity to do? Do the same thing. Forget the ruh in you. You're just clay. You're just dirt. And what does shaitan call you to? All things that your clay existence wants. The food the temptation, the shelter, the, everything that, that this world has to offer, that Salah Shaitan wants, sees in you, that's all he wants you to reduce yourself to. To, to, to humiliate yourself and not acknowledge your soul. قَالَ فَخْرُجْ مِنْهَا فَإِنَّكَ رَجِيمٌ he, So Allah said, expel, get out of here. You are the cursed one. And also marjum, raja means to, to pelt. So you're the one that gets to be pelted. وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكَ لَعْنَتِي إِلَى يَوْمِ الدِّينِ And upon you exclusively is my curse. Until the day of the full judgment. قَالَ رَبِّي فَأَنذِرْنِي Then he said, Master, in that case, let me, let me stay around. Give me time. Wait for me. إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ Until the day that they are raised. قَالَ فَإِنَّكَ مِنَ الْمُنْظَرِينَ Then Allah said to him, Fine, then you are from those who are given time to, to exist. Until then, you are given time uh, 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 to wait. إِلَى يَوْمِ الْوَقْتِ الْمَعْلُومِ until the day of the known time. Until the day of the known time. قَالَ فَبِعِزَّتِكَ He says, I swear by the authority you have. Because Allah has by His authority given him that time. That's an expression of Allah's authority that He gave him time to, to stick around. I swear by the authority you've granted me. لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ I will absolutely delude them, take them off the path, all of them all together. إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ Except a slave among yours that have been granted wisdom, that have been granted sincerity. What was the previous surah's focus? الْعِبَادَ الْمُخْلَصِينَ إِنَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا الْمُخْلَصِينَ The slaves that have been given sincerity, the slaves that have been given sincerity. He says, you intervene and give them sincerity, I won't be able to do anything about it. قَالَ فَالْحَقُّ Then Allah said, the truth then. And the truth is what I say. I will absolutely fill hell with you. And whoever among them follows you all together. We've already seen the scene of hell in this surah. And now we're taken back to where the saga began. That's the, that's the way the surah is progressing. Tell them, I'm not asking you for any compensation. And I'm not from the people that Allah, the, the term here is al-mutakallif, al-mutasanni'ah. 
The one who manufactures, makes something up. الَّذِي يُظْهِرُ شَيْئًا فَوْقَ قَدْرِهِ الْمَنُوطْ بِهِ The one who tries to show something above his natural ability. When you, for example, وَمِنْ قَوْلِهِ وَمِنْ ذَلِكَ قَوْلُ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم is a hadith of the Prophet صلى لَا تَتَكَلَّفُوا لِلْضَيْفِ فَتَبْغُضُوهُ يَعْنِي لَا تُحَمِّلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ فَوْقَ طَاقَتِهَا means Allah, the Messenger said صلى الله عليه وسلم don't do takalluf now I'm going to use the word takalluf being fully warned that this you will understand takalluf in their own way don't do takalluf means don't put yourself in difficulty don't artificially take a load on that you know you can't handle when it comes to the, the, the guest, a life. In other words, it's really late at night, somebody calls you, hey, can I come over? And you say, yeah, yeah, sure, of course, of course, of course. Even though you're not ready and you can't really take them, and you should just be honest, if you can't handle it, don't do it, because once you do it, and they stay until 3 a.m., you're going to be angry at them. فَتَبْغُضُوهُ The Prophet said, you're going to get mad at them, and that's not a good deed. You didn't do anybody a favor by saying yes and then being mad at them. You know, once they leave, like, I can't believe this guy shows up at 3 in the morning. Well, if you're going to do that, then don't invite him. Don't invite him. So takallaf actually means to try to do something that's beyond your capability. To artificially try to do something that you're not able to handle. Allah is saying, or the messenger is told to say, don't tell them, I'm pretending to be a messenger out of my norm. Or I'm, pre- I'm really working hard to make up this Qur'an that's not my natural being. Because they know he's not a poet. They know he can't handle poetry. And I, I didn't all, all of a sudden become a poet. And the same thing, you know, the, the Thai in Arabic does that. There's Sha'ir, poet. There's Mutashair, guy who tries really hard to be a poet. Guy who's really trying hard. So, so there's Mukallif, who can hold a load. Then there's Mutakallif, trying really hard, pretending to hold a load. To pretend to, to, to take it. Okay? There's, there's a vahara to demonstrate, there's tavahara to pretend, to just show. In huwa illa dhikru lil alameen. This is nothing but a reminder for all nations. Wala ta'lamunna naba'ahu, and you will absolutely get to know its news. Its news meaning you'll get to see for your own eyes what it actually means. Ba'da heen, after a little bit of time. After just some time, you'll get to see. You see, the same surah says, "Huwa naba'un alim." This is a huge event, and what is it? The akhirah. That scene, you will soon see after a little while. So that concludes our study of Surat As-Sad. I'm not giving you a break, and we're going to start the study of Surat Az-Zumar.